Hey everyone, welcome to a joint meeting this morning with House Health Care and Senate Health and Welfare. And we have the pleasure of having by state with us today. It is by state primary care association and it is their day in the state house, which we always enjoy seeing everyone and hearing what you're doing. So we're gonna start, I think with a, probably a quick introduction and then bring some of the, um, I think we have three of the different FQHCs to come forward and we'll just have a good conversation. So introduce yourself and- Thank you. Good morning, for the record, I'm Georgia Meharis, Senior Vice President of Policy and Strategy for Bi-State Primary Care Association, resident of Montpelier, very proudly, despite our very slippery sidewalks oh, today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the roads are fine though, if you walk on those. That's what I did this morning, yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as the chair indicated, we are hosting our legislative day today and are excited to bring some of our challenges and opportunities to this joint committee meeting. Um, also, if uh, we're in the card room today, so uh, you're able to stop by, please do. Um, we have a little bit of a game and some jelly beans oh, hello. Um, for those interested. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to be very brief. I'm just here to open us up and I'm going to invite three of my colleagues um, from the community health centers of the Chittenden and Southern Grand Isle counties, um, the Springfield region and Arlington, Vermont. So Jeff McKee, Kayla Davis and Josh Dufresne are going to do the rest of the testimony. And do you want to come up together or separately? It's up to you. I think together might make the yeah. there, there's three chairs. Great. Come on up. Thanks for coming in so early. <laughs> See what yeah, that was that, uh, <laughs> so good morning. Uh, I am uh, Jeff McKee. I'm the CEO of the Community Health Centers. Uh, we serve Chittenden County and Southern Grand Isle County. And I'm going to go first and just pass those around if you don't mind. Um, a lot of facts and figures related to the Community Health Centers. I'm not going to go over the whole list of things, but they're there for you. Your reference. One of the things that I really want to make sure that this um, joint committee here this morning understands is that federally qualified health centers are different than other kinds of primary care and other kinds of health care generally. And uh, one of the things that makes us different is all of our missions include um, a commitment to health equity that manifests different in how we deliver services. So just to I'm probably preaching to the choir, but to say the difference between health equity and health equality, health equality, we all do that. We open our services to anybody. Anybody can come. Anybody can come regardless of their ability to pay. We all do that. And many healthcare organizations do that. That's health equality. We don't close the doors to anyone. Health equity um, challenges us to go further and to understand the barriers that different segments of our community have in accessing health care which creates um, uh, health disparities across the communities. And so in each of our missions, it, it looks different in every community because every community demographic is different, but all of us uh, challenge ourselves to understand who is not getting served. So it's not just about the people who walk in our doors, which every healthcare uh, organization tries to serve. It's those who don't, who can't, who won't, who are afraid to, don't know how, whose other conditions and social determinants of health prevent them from getting to us. So we have a variety of services that we offer um, to kind of get to that last mile of healthcare in our communities. And if we don't do it, nobody else does. Right? So that's the thing that's truly unique about federally qualified health centers. There is no one else doing this work, leaning into the work the way that we do. Um, part of our missions, as I said, and we are so proud to do it every day. This is not a complaint. This is just to you know who we are. We wake up every day living this mission. Um, in, the, in the case of the community health centers, just to give a couple of highlights. So uh, we're the state's uh, only uh, home, uh, healthcare for the homeless program as well. So in Chittenden County, uh, that means that we do a lot of work, uh, you know, working with people who are not our patients yet. Uh, trying to do the outreach. We literally have people who strap on backpacks and walk into the woods and in encampments in tent cities, go to the motels and hotels and try to engage people and offer them care. As I said to Senator Lyons this morning, uh, briefly, uh, we have to now challenge ourselves to also understand uh, our competitive, where we uh, need to do things better with respect to substance use disorder treatment. Um, drug dealers uh, don't make you take a bus to get 
30 minutes away to a methadone treatment center, um, they show up at your door at home, right? So where we're located, you look at us, we have nine locations in Chittenden County. Uh, that's a lot for a small footprint, but we understand if we're not in those locations, people make other choices about accessing their health care because it's too high. So we have that outreach program. Much of that care, even though we have a, a, a small grant to do the HH program, um, is uncompensated care. We do it because it's permission to take uh, funds that we have from other parts of the organization and we, we uh, subsidize that, that outreach into the community. That's vitally important, right? And across the state, but particularly in Chittenden County, in my opinion. Um, we also have an elder care program. Um, and uh, our elder care program provides, we do home, we, uh, we do house coverage uh, and we help people age in place throughout the, throughout the community. People who would otherwise access the ER still services at a much higher rate. Um, and as you can imagine, when you're providing those kinds of outreach services that require travel, you're working with patients with multiple complexities, social determinants of health complexities, as well as medical complexities, and often with people who have not had their health care needs appropriately addressed for years, these are not 15-minute visits. Right? Our model looks different and requires different kinds of funding. My clinicians can't see 15-minute uh, appointments, rarely ever. And then you add to that the complexities of the outreach and the work that we do. Um, it requires a different kind of fund to do that work. And we're grateful that the model we've been offered by the state of, or by the federal government um, actually supports that. If we lean into our mission, uh, we will be okay. Um, and if the, if the funding is there from the states and the commercial payers as well to, to make it all work, we have a problem right now that it's not working, right? The funding is not there adequately to continue that. And in our case, uh, last year we had a one, uh, we had a, a, well, this current year, we're gonna likely have a, a $1.2 million deficit. We're starting to put together our budget for next year. I'm looking at a $2 million budget uh, deficit. I don't know how to close that at this moment. Right? I can't cut any more staff. We actually had layoffs last year. That's real. That's likely to happen again. And the programs that get cut are not the ones that have a revenue source attached that serve the people who uh, are the most well off in our community. The programs that have to get cut because the financial math only works this way are the ones that don't have a revenue source attached to them <laughs> and are those all mission aligned and are, and are serve our most vulnerable members of our community. Uh, and uh, um, so that's, that's where we're at. And so, uh, I, you know, I think the, the staff we have, we certainly have over 450 staff, or uh, 350 staff, uh, and, um, you know, they wake up every day doing the work, and um, there's a commitment that I've made to them, and I always felt like the, uh, the state of Vermont stood behind me. We'll figure out how to keep the lights on so you can do that work. I'm having trouble kind of saying that with confidence uh, in the last couple of years. That's our story. It's, uh, I think Kayla's going to go. Next. Right. Let's go right to Kayla. That'd be great. Yeah, and I'm going to uh, try to share my screen. <clears throat> uh, Madam Chairs, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on the role of the health centers in our communities, um, how our services are responsive to the unique needs in each of our communities. Uh, and their residents. My name is Kayla Davis, and I'm honored to be one of the co-executive directors at Battenkill Valley Health Center in Arlington. Um, much like Jeff uh, pointed out, I want to talk about how FQHCs are different. Uh, we have rigorous requirements attached to the federal funding that we, we have to help support our, our programs. Um, but we see the sickest patients, we see the patients with the highest level of need, um, while also being held to extremely rigorous healthcare standards. Um, we, we cannot manage our payer mix, so many other healthcare entities can decide which revenue stream, so commercial insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, um, which visits are the most uh, revenue generating and decide who, what patients to welcome, we can't do that. As if we're open to new patients, we're open to all, regardless of ability to pay Medicaid status, um, and that is part of our mission. 
while the work is high in cost and labor, it's our mission. This is the work that the community health center movement set out to do all those years ago. BVHC is teeny tiny. We're located in Arlington. We have a little campus with two buildings. We serve just over 4,000 patients and um, our payer mix is split about a third between Medicare, Medicaid and the commercially insured. Um, but 48% of our patients with known income levels are living at or below 200% of federal poverty. Our patients are, are different. Um, this is why the sliding fee scale program that we offer as FQHCs is so important because it ensures that regardless of ability to pay, people can access healthcare in our building. More than 25% of Bennington County residents are enrolled in SNAP. In fiscal year 23, BVHC distributed almost 1,700 bags of fresh food through a partnership with Veggie Van Gogh, 4,600 pounds of food from our food shelves, which are located in each of our waiting rooms. Um, and that's supported through private donations and the Arlington area food shelf. Bennington County suicide rates, overdose mortality rates, and mentally unhealthy days are higher than the state and national averages. Um, this is why we have four therapists on staff, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, why all of our providers um, prescribe Suboxone for substance use disorder. Um, we're at a critical point in this state and this work is so important and people need to access it regardless of whether or not they can pay for it. Um, <clears throat> oral health care. Bennington County has a dearth of dentists, um, but for those who have Medicaid, it's even harder to access services. I think we are one of three currently, but SVMC's dental practice, I'm not sure if they're closing, will be one of two um, dental offices accepting Medicaid. Um, we, we do that work in the office, and then we also go out into the community because we know that there's not access to dentists. So if we can educate children, parents, if we can get toothbrushes into the hands of these folks, it's, a, it's something, right? So, so we're in the classrooms, we're in daycares, we're in public um, settings, we're in local businesses. Um, and last fiscal year, we distributed over 3,300 toothbrushes into the community with help of uh, private grants. Chronic conditions in Bennington County are high, and um, this, is, this is one of the things that sets FQHCs apart. We do population health management, and we try to teach life skills. So we provide um, walking groups. We provide free cooking classes um, to promote overall mental health and physical wellness, but also to help people develop those life skills that they may not have. Um, and again, it's free. They get to take the food home, and they get... Um, a skill out of those classes. Um, we have a partnership with Green Mountain Express. It provides free transportation to and from medical appointments, dental appointments, mental health appointments, um, to ensure that transportation is never a barrier to care. We're in rural communities. Um, we are located on the Green Mountain Express bus line, but if, if folks um, have uh, mobility issues that don't allow them to utilize the bus line, then we pay for door-to-door -door service. Um, and we believe that teaching children about health at a young age makes a difference. Um, we supplement the uh, Arlington School District's healthcare curriculum. Um, our providers go in. It's a wonderful opportunity to lead discussions with up-to-date information. It exposes children to different healthcare professions at the same time. Um, and in last fiscal year, we gave 27 health presentations in local schools and daycares. We're also doing working with um, GNAT, the public health or the public um, access television in Manchester, to do um, mental health and medical. Uh, shows so that we can get information about ticks and um, different things out into the community. We're also committed to being part of the solution for the health professional shortage that we're experiencing in the state, um, and it's national, but the state of Vermont um, is experiencing it hard as well. We host interns from many different fields, um, but our proudest accomplishment is that five of the 15 dental students that we've hosted have stayed in Vermont. So critical. In summary, a uh, health center model is unique. We strive to be responsive to the needs of our individual communities. We work with community, community partners to reduce barriers to care and expand programming. And we are constantly working on ways 
to find equitable access to quality health care. <laughs> um, <clears throat> each health center serves a unique population and we have unique costs. Our costs are growing at a much faster rate than our reimbursement. Um, like our peers, we're projecting a loss for fiscal year 24. Um, in order to continue to do this work, we need to be receiving reimbursement that aligns with federal regulations. We are at a critical point. Uh, with federal funds that have provided insulation over the last several years expiring, we have to find a way to assure uh, that the safety of the community health centers is there to safeguard the care that one in three Vermonters currently receive. Thank you, Kayla. Such good work. Josh? Everybody, thanks for being here today. Thanks for listening. I'm Josh Dufresne. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Springfield Medical Care Systems is our corporate name. That may be familiar to many of you. We were in the headlines quite a bit back in 2019. We are now doing business as North Star Health, which is a federally qualified health center without a hospital. Um, we did spin that off. We have uh, 13 locations that are primary care, dental. We're actually in the schools as well. Um, we do have a mobile unit that goes out and meets people that are homebound we take care of approximately 25,000 patients, and we see about 100,000 visits per year. It's getting harder and harder to run my organization. Last year, we did have a loss. Coming out from bankruptcy, you can imagine that we didn't really have any reserves. All of those were pretty much liquidated. So we had to pull ourselves up from our bootstraps. What I'm seeing right now is a loss from last fiscal year. Our fiscal year starts in October. I've already got a $1.1 million loss this year from operations. So what I'm starting to look at is cash on hand, not necessarily operations, other than trying to improve it the best of my ability. And that's getting more and more difficult. Not long ago, Senator Sanders called me and asked me to spread the FQHC down into Brattleboro, into the Brattleboro region. And we've had some good conversation with those individuals in Brattleboro, and they want our help. The business plans aren't coming out in the black, and that's frustrating. We offer a huge amount of enabling services, whether it's behavioral health, whether it's the dental aspect, the primary care, or even vision care. We're one of the only FQHCs in the state that have two optometrists that help people get eyeglasses. If you can't see, it's hard to get a job. If you don't have front teeth, it's basically impossible to get a job. These are the types of things that FQHCs do. We are your safety net in the state of Vermont. And I can echo what Kayla and Jeff had said today. We are very proud to do the work that we do. We open our doors to everybody and anybody, regardless of anything. There's actually a quite a long list, but anything, we open that door. We want to be sustainable. We want to take care of our patients. And one of the ways that I've been trying to revolutionize primary care in the area that we serve is to integrate lifestyle medicine. Some of you may have heard of lifestyle medicine. If you haven't, check out the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, ACLM. And we are taking care of patients by asking them how their stress load is. That's different, right? And this is in primary care. So how's your stress? How's your sleep? If you have a smartwatch, you might know what your sleep looks like, right? And you're like, oh, I gotta do better. What's your nutrition look like? And how does that affect your sleep? How does that affect depression? Those meetings with patients take time. I'm paid primarily by volume. So I have to tell my medical staff, about 45 individuals, see more, see quicker, take less time. As a patient, that's the absolute worst case scenario because I'm going to go into an exam room, I'm gonna spend 10 minutes with my nurse or my MA, maybe five or so with my clinician. Did I get all the problems out that I needed to? No, and that makes it really hard. So what do you do? You reschedule the patient to come back in three weeks. They don't have a car. We have to get a van. We have to get a bus <laughs> ride. And we get some help with that. We have some free couriers that help move people around. We did receive a grant during COVID. Ironically, if COVID happened when it did, we probably wouldn't have gone bankrupt due to the funding that came to the organization. Um, that would have bailed us out at the time, so we could have taken care of a lot of things. But to be in bankruptcy and then also have COVID hit, that was a tough mountain to climb. I can tell you, just getting back online and having the operations go the way it did, we got some rain in July. That took out two of my clinics. Mm -hmm. So I had to shut down Ludlow Health Center. I had to shut down Ludlow Dental. Both of those locations were flooded up to the first floor and required complete mold removal, 
new HVAC systems. And in dental, the insurance company doesn't cover your dental equipment that's in the basement, such as suction, vacuums, those type of things. I did not make money on the flood. I thank the state of Vermont for their help um, and many others that did help us, but we did not make any money on that flood. And that was very difficult for the patients. We did park our mobile unit out in the middle of Ludlow and we were able to help people that needed immediate care. The last thing I want to mention is walk-in care, acute care. We do offer that, and it's much different than what I would refer to as urgent care, which is mostly a for-profit organization. For walk-in care, we take care of people that can't get into their primary care right away, which is a thing everywhere, it seems. There's not enough primary care folks, and that's because they don't maybe make the same as a specialty or a subspecialty. So doctors are going into those type of fields instead to pay off loans and debt. The walk-in side of what we provide is something that will allow people to then establish with primary care. We find a lot of people that that's their primary care walk-in and that's not where you should receive your primary care. It's a necessary evil. We have to be there because it's take, keeping people out of the emergency room. For lifestyle medicine, we have reversed chronic conditions without pharmacy. That's huge. That's gonna get cut if I can't be sustainable. I'll have to have lifestyle medicine, which is near and dear to my heart. Georgia can tell you, I talk about it all the time. We'll have to go away. These enabling services will have to be reduced. And the way that this structure works, you don't have more money if you're small, and it's harder to have more money if you're bigger. So it's not necessarily the model, it's the reimbursement. So I really want to thank you for listening and thank you for all the help that you can provide. Great. Thank you all for, and your colleagues, for all the work you do for Vermonters. It definitely is vital. We we have a couple of minutes if there's can questions. I, can I talk yeah, first? absolutely. Uh, so before we jump into questions, I just want to say thank you again on behalf of Senate and House Health and Welfare, Health and Welfare and Health. Um, and a couple of comments. Uh, before we finish, it would be great for folks who also are here from FQHCs to introduce themselves. So we could go down the line, that would be great. But why don't we do that first, and then I have one more comment and other questions. I'm Dr. John Matthew from the Health Center in Plainfield. I'm the CEO and the medical director. This time I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Northern Communities Healthcare Survey for Vermont Northeast. I'm now the CFO for Community Health Centers of the Rutland region. Thank you all for being here, and <laughs> we're thinking that your colleagues have spoken for you in many ways, so we appreciate that. Uh, just to say that your your comments are extremely well taken, and certainly as we're going to be hearing testimony regarding Act 167, which is uh, an evaluation of community needs and linkage of community services with hospital-based care and other care that uh, you're, you are on the ground floor for this, and we appreciate uh, very much that work. Um, we do, we do, we work collectively and together on ensuring sustainability, in particular for primary care as we work toward health care reform. So thank you for your work. So I'll go to questions. Alyssa. Um, and yes, thank you so much for your work. So I was wondering, um, in our budget last, this fiscal year, there is a big expansion of the Hop and Spoke a two-year grant, um, you know, the Burlington Community Health Centers, um, you're the largest spoke, although I guess I thought you were a hub, but maybe I got my hub. You're a spoke. You're a spoke. I'm wondering if you um, are seeing any of this yet or projections of what you may be receiving um, yes. from this. So, uh, so we, we are definitely expanding our services there, um, it, you know, for in the in the spoke arena and so the, the funding that comes through the blueprint and that funds the spokes uh, will continue to expand that uh, as needed. What we're really uh, thinking about though is how we have to do that service different. The hub and spoke model was amazing. We we're part of that. I've been around for a long time now. <laughs> I was part of that from when it started and, and it was a national kind of best practice. But the substance use um, profile in our communities has changed dramatically. And so patients that want to walk into a clinic can get buprenorphine and whether buprenorphine in an outpatient setting is really then is going to meet the need of people who are uh, addicted to uh, fentanyl and, and other kinds of opiates is a uh, 
is a different kind of a question. So we're grateful for the funding. We are gonna see that. We are looking to uh, expand the number of uh, clinicians and support for that. But it's, uh, I'm not sure that's getting at the problem we're experiencing, at least in Chittenden County. Are you seeing the money yet or? Um, I don't believe we've seen any of the money yet. So I know our team's been talking about the expansion. Uh, but it's also driven by the number of patients we have, so, right? So I, I think we are working with uh, the state, uh, the number of, because it's based on the number of Medicaid patients you serve. Um, and so uh, that's, we're trying to figure out how to do that outreach to get more of those patients in the door. And we've been assured that the funding will be there if we can do that. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'm going to alternate between House and Senate. So Ruth. <laughs> Thank you, Madam. Sorry, I should say Senator Hardy. I'm no, okay. much more informal in our committee. Okay, but Senator Hardy. It's just fun. Lori. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys, and so apologies for walking in a little bit late. Um, but um, I have two questions. First, similar to what um, Rep. Black just asked, um, in Bennington, they are starting a hub, actually, and I'm assuming you're a spoke. We're a spoke. Okay. And so have you seen any impact yet? I think they just opened or maybe are about to open the hub? Yeah, so we haven't seen it yet, but we're working with, so our, the model, um, the blueprint model in Bennington County is a little bit different. The funds go through the hospital. They're the employer for, um, to try to make it so that you have a full-time employee um, with benefits because we have such small practices throughout the region. Uh -huh. um, and we're, they're talking about uh, placing a full-time community health worker with those funds um, at Batten Kill, and that will be hugely amazing for our patients. Okay, great. The, the, the Peace Blueprint is, is an amazing program, and I would suggest never taking that away, <laughs> uh, please. But um, it, it doesn't change revenue stream, right? They're, yeah. they're free services. It's amazing to have those wraparound services for our patients, but it doesn't get at the budget problem that we're seeing. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, so yes, we're seeing staff and, and we're so appreciative for that. Okay. And then I have a question for you in sure. Springfield. I didn't quite understand how you spun off from the hospital sure. debacle sure. So, for lack of a better word. Um, so are you, was it the hospital practices that were associated with the hospital that became an FQHC? Yes, after a, a very long period of time. And so a lot okay. of the private physician offices, they weren't sustainable. So the hospital employed them all. Uh -huh. And then the hospital became rural health centers for their primary care group Okay. in an FQHC. And the FQHC was positioned above the hospital. The hospital was a subsidiary at the time. Okay, so the hospital is a subsidiary of the FQHC? It was. Okay. It was, but it okay. is no, no longer. Correct. The hospital still is a the hospital. The hospital is still functioning. As but a you're hospital. split now. Split. We're, we're good partners, but we are no longer affiliated. I see. Okay. Okay. And then I guess my final question for all of you, and maybe I missed this because you said it in the beginning. Um, what I, I hear you about the financial struggles, and that sucks, for lack of a better word. Um, what is your ask of us today, specifically? Besides, we we need your help. But what do you have a specific ask that you're coming to us with? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and that over to Georgia. Okay. <laughs> uh, hello again, Georgia Harris from Bi State. Um, uh, we submitted a letter to the appropriation committees earlier this week, requesting 2.8 million dollars in appropriations to shore up the Medicaid reimbursement so that Medicaid is fully compliant with paying their fair share for the cost of Medicaid services. Okay. Do we have that letter as well? I believe we cc the chairs. Okay. It would be great if we could get that on our website or have it. Can you resend that? Sure. That would be excellent. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and obviously those are conversations we'll continue to have. As a, yeah, I just want to say it's a budget conversation. Right. We will not be talking about it in our committee until we see the budget, right. but it, it's there. And we did get the letter in appropriations. So when you resend it, make sure it goes to two committees. That'd be great. Um, just one more question. Uh, let's take one more minute. Right, for right. One last question. Um, Representative Rebecca from Winooski. Uh, <clears throat> regarding your um, budget gaps, I'm, I'm curious as the state, um, I know Department of Mental Health and some of the designated agencies have been exploring the CCBHC Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics model. Um, 
and those have a federal required, well, enhanced um, Medicaid reimbursement rate. I'm wondering if any of you are involved with that, since that model does have a requirement to collaborate with FQHCs. Are any of you involved? Is that at all a benefit to some of your challenges? Um, in, in Chittenden County, we have a, a really nice uh, relationship between the Community Health Centers and the Howard Center. And uh, it is our hope that when they get to integrating with primary care, certainly they do collaboration with our primary care and our own sites, but we've also talked about uh, uh, down the road trying to envision uh, integrating primary care into the, uh, into the Howard Center. So we're having those conversations um, and trying to plan for that. But as far as it's not at the moment. And I would echo that for Springfield. We work very closely with HCRS, Healthcare Rehabilitation Services, and they're at the table at the Brattleboro expansion as well and how we can work together. Great. Can we ask Kayla to send her slides? For can you send your slides to Claire and Neil? Yes. So we can have them. That would be excellent. Thank you. Um, again, thank you all very much for coming early this morning. We do have testimony for the next couple of hours. And I know you're only in the card room until noon, but hopefully there'll be some time to have some conversations uh, with us at the table later. And uh, many of our colleagues, hopefully we'll stop by the table. So again, thank you for all your work for Vermonters. It is vitally important. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So I think we're gonna stay live and switch to 167. Yeah, go to 167. You went over here and <laughs> was there. Yeah, get this. I didn't get it. Okay, I'll pass it over. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, <laughs> yeah, we'll, it's just like 10,000 people. Yeah, okay. Like, how, what do you want to put it up? That's my question. Yeah. What did you say? Talk, just talk. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. 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 Okay.
in collaboration with the Green Mountain Care Board, develop a proposal for the state's next agreement with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Education um, to ensure Medicaid participation in multi-payer alternative payment models in Vermont. There were a number of considerations that had to be taken into account in developing the proposal that were spelled out in the legislation um, and also some ex uh, specific alternative payment models to be explored. The development process had to have opportunities for meaningful participation by the stakeholders. Uh, so that was the first part of section one. Section two, uh, the second part of section one was directing the Green Mountain Care Board to uh, collaborate with the Agency of Human Services and use that stakeholder process to develop, to develop uh, value-based payments, including global payments from all payers to Vermont hospitals or accountable care organizations or both. And there were specific factors to be taken into consideration there as well. And there were reports due on each of these uh, last January and March, respectively. Section two dealt with the hospital system transformation uh, and, and engagement process and directed the Green Mountain Care Board, in, again, in collaboration with the Director of Healthcare Reform in the Agency of Human Services to develop and conduct an engagement process for Vermont hospital transformation. And there were a number of factors specified um, and what that was supposed to look like with an update on the community engagement process last January. Um, $900,000 was appropriated in the FY23 budget for the Agency of Human Services work and $4.1 million for the Green Mountain Care Board's work. And then you passed a couple of provisions last year that kind of uh, piggybacked on some of these. So there was a requirement in uh, the in Act 51, which had been H206, um, on the responsibilities of the Department of Vermont Health Access and other provisions that added, effectively added a new section to Act 167, even though it wasn't in there uh, when originally passed that directed the Agency of Human Services to engage in transformation planning with up to four hospitals to reduce inefficiencies, lower costs, improve population health outcomes, reduce health inequities, and increase access to essential services while maintaining sufficient capacity for emergency management. Um, and so that went to the report due, um, progress report due in February of this year to your committees. And in last year's budget, there was also a requirement that the Green Mountain Care Board submit an update to the Health Reform Oversight Committee by November uh, about various things having to do with hospital performance um, and, uh, and hospital transformation. So that occurred in November of this year at the Health Reform Oversight Committee meeting. And now here we are. Okay, thank you. Good. So um, we're going to begin with the Green Mountain Care Board and uh, see you behind me. So all, do all, all three of you want to come up? Okay, why don't we do that? If you need a spot to put your materials, can you share? Share. All right. Oh, you're good at sharing. So we have, uh, do we have what you're presenting on our web page or is it something different? Oh, yes. how do you want to go? You should have a copy. We will share our slides and just take a moment. Uh, okay, we can put those up here. So this is the update from our, under Owen Foster's name. And we'll, Claire's putting it up.
Claire's not putting it up. She's putting, She's it, putting it up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Always IT. Apologies, why? She's doing that too, right? Too. Okay. Introduction. I'm trying to join the Zoom and then I can just run the slides if that works. Yep, that's fine. Right. You should be able to share now, Claire is saying. Yes, we can see you in, in double. Okay, so so great. <laughs> <laughs> Just what you wanted. So close. All right, so now that it's up, uh, why don't we have you introduce yourselves for the record and we will listen to your um, presentation information. Great. Um, well, first, thank you, Chairs, for inviting us and for the committee members to be here to hear us today. Uh, my name is Owen Foster. I'm the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, I started in October of 2022, so I've been there about a year and a few months. I'll introduce themselves. Good morning. My name is Marissa Melamed, Associate Director of Health Systems Policy for the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I've worked with the board for, uh, well, quite a while now, since 2016, on um, most of the different regulatory processes uh, that the board oversees, as well as their special projects. I'm great. I'm Elena Barabee, the Director of Health Systems Finance for the board. I recently returned to the board after taking a few years of work on my dissertation um, and PhD work at Dartmouth in Health Policy and Clinical. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'll give you a little overview of what we'll be discussing today. Um, first, we're just going to give a reminder of who the Green Mountain Care Board is and what we do and what we, what we don't do, don't have authority for. I'll speak a little bit about our process and then some general information about the state of the state in healthcare and how we're doing. And I think that's relevant context for the work that we're doing through 167, why we're doing the work, and then we can discuss what we're doing exactly. Uh, um, so the Green Mountain Care Board was established in 2011, and um, I wanted to focus on one thing here uh, first, which is quasi-judicial. Um, I'm a lawyer myself. Uh, our executive director is a lawyer, and Robin Lunge is a lawyer. So there's, there's two board members who are lawyers. But quasi-judicial, what it means is it has a judicial character or sort of uh, some risk of judicial nature, such as like a court proceeding. And what we do uh, largely is we review budgets, make decisions on budgets. And we do that by holding hearings and receiving evidence and having witnesses and receiving testimony. And our job is to evaluate that information and then to make factual determinations and conclusions based on the evidence that we receive. So uh, this process is important because it helps us get at what is the best decision, right? We can challenge certain statements that are made to us, right? Everyone has context that's relevant to what they say, but there can be a broader context and that can influence a decision, right? So we're actually trying to think about the entire healthcare system. And I think one thing that the last presentation said was an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's something that's really top of mind for us. We have a lot of problems in Vermont with our prevention. We have inadequate primary care. We have inadequate mental health. We have inadequate long-term care. Those things help prevent illness. They also save money. So they're right from an equity standpoint and they're right from a financial standpoint. So when we're making decisions, some of the information we're receiving in those hearings that we're evaluating, we're thinking about it not just from the perspective of the entity that's before us, but from the ent all entities that are in the healthcare system. And more importantly, from the patients, right? Because there's a lot of competing things. We have a very solemn duty. It's a hard duty. It's not that much fun at times. But what we do is people ask us for a lot of money, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, right? So I think the last hospital budget cycle might have been about three and a half billion dollars or so requests. Those are gobs of Vermonters' money. And the rate requests, what those mean is how much money is being taken from ratepayers, all of your constituents, our neighbors, our friends. They're farmers, they're trades professionals, they're restaurant workers, they're everybody. And when you have a large rate increase, that hits them in the pocket. They have less money to do other things, right? Less money to buy good food, less money to go to the gym, less money to go on vacation, less money to invest in their business. So when we're asked to give a lot of money 
it's a really solemn duty. You have to take it very, very, very seriously. And so that's what this process is for. Um, the legislature recognized this. In 2011, they set up this board with uh, five independent members, right? And we're different. We have different backgrounds, different professional educational backgrounds. Um, and that, to my mind, is that we want people uh, who, it's not one person, right? Everyone has a different view that we bring when we hear that evidence, different life experiences. Um, and so it's not just one person, and it's not behind closed doors. It's in a public hearing, it's very transparent. It's apolitical. We're independent. We do not work in the executive branch. We do not get feedback from the governor. We do not get feedback from legislators, right? And that's a really good thing because we want somebody to be able to look at this information really objectively and make the best decision we can. So that's why the structure is what it is. Um, it, it's interesting, while we're different and we have different views, um, this last year, I've been there one year, been through all the cycles, the amount of times that we voted together is overwhelming. Uh, most of our votes are unanimous, even on the big substantive meeting ones. So if you look at the hospital budgets, we have 14 hospital budgets we decide, and there's five of us. Um, Merman, uh, member Merman, he abstained from uh, uh, the UVM once. He works at CBMC. Uh, I think the votes were 66 to one. 66 votes, all exactly the same, one vote not on 14 hospital budgets. So pretty, pretty uniform and consistent. Um, on the uh, hospital budget guidance, it was 10 votes. One, we had two votes on it because there's an appeal. 10 votes, all uniform. Um, on rate review, 20 votes zero opposing. So while we come from from very different places right now in this time in Vermont, we're seeing very consistent and similar things and recognizing that as a group um, that comes from these problems very differently, but we're, we're voting consistently together. Um, the only one where we don't uh, is the ACO. On the ACO, uh, I think we've had two, maybe four substantive votes. Um, one was four to one, one was three to two, uh, another one is four to one, and another one was five to zero. So again, pretty consistent, but on that one, we have had some more uh, disagreement as to what the right course of action is, which isn't really that surprising, right? There's a lot of history with the ACO. There's a lot of expectations, some fair, some not. And um, so we have, <laughs> that's a healthy thing. We want that. But generally in the big meeting ones, this group of five people votes together, uh, almost always. Um, so what we're trying to do is make decisions, as I said, that really benefit the entirety of the system. And one of the decisions we made this last year, which I think was um, kind of under the radar, but I thought really important, was on our rate review decisions. And on those decisions, we uh, put in a provision that said when insurance companies decide how much money to award to various people they're negotiating with, they have to consider affordability, access, and quality in those decisions because we want to sustain parts of the system that are affordable. We want to sustain mental health. We must sustain primary care, we must. But what was happening in Vermont was there was a very large disparity between what regulated entities were receiving in rate increases versus everyone else. And we didn't dictate, give them this, give them this. But what we did say was insurance companies need to be cognizant of that. And they need to think about that in their decisions because if they're not, we're not putting the money where it needs to go. And so that's why we did that. And we'll see how it goes this year and we'll see what the results are. Um, on this slide, the one that I think is most important is accountable. Um, we're a creature of the legislature. We are accountable to you and to your constituents. Um, I think it's fair for the legislature to ask us, how are you doing on affordability? How is Vermont performing? And if it's your task and you have all these authorities, tell me what you think. Are you doing well? Or are you doing poorly? On access, same thing. We have huge access problems in the state to many different types of care that are really important. We need to be accountable to you and to your constituents as to how we're doing on access. If access is bad, it's not going to be all our fault, right? We're one part of the system. There's other parts that have other levers. But I think all of us collectively at this point in time need to be accountable for, for these things that Vermonters need. Um, I'll give one anecdote that really resonated with me in my old career. I was a Department of Justice lawyer, I was a prosecutor, I did healthcare fraud cases. And one of my mentors said, there's people who make cases and people who tell you why. You don't wanna hear from us and people who get paid to do this work, why we can't. You need to hear why we can and how we're gonna do it. 
not we're a small part, not we can't control this. We, we need to actually come up with solutions. And that's be accountable. So I expect those questions. I think they're fair questions and I think they should be asked. Um, another component of accountability is um, the transparent nature of our work. We have um, meetings, public meetings, almost every week. We had 53 last year. And at these public meetings, there's notice and anybody who wants can attend. And they've been remote since COVID, so you get people from all over the state who otherwise couldn't come to Montpelier, couldn't afford to drive here, couldn't deal with the hassle of coming here, whatever it might be. And they come in on the Zoom and um, have a time where anybody can come and do whatever they want. A regulated entity, a patient, any, anybody, people from out of state, people from out of state do participate. Um, and it's really insightful, right? Because it's really important to get the whole gamut of information when you're making decisions. You need to hear from the patients. You need to hear from the businesses. You need to hear from the hospitals. You need to hear from the primary care. You just need to. And so this avenue that we have, this requirement that we have, um, gives us that ability. It's a really important mechanism to what we do. Um, we also receive tons of written public comment, tons. So this last year in the hospital budget cycle, we had to start with guidance. We say what the targets are. And in that process, I think we received, there's an appeal to have us go to a higher level of, uh, of money. And I think there was close to like 200 public comments we received. And they're really valuable, right? So there's a huge chunk from um, hospital board members, members of the boards full of the hospitals. And they shared their view as to why they should have a higher guidance level. And that was really valuable to understand why that money was needed from their perspective. But then there's a huge collection of people who had views as to like all the independence, the mental health and everybody else as to why it should be lower because of the impact, the collateral impact a higher amount would have on them. And they shared that view. And then we had the patient's view of if you go higher, what is this gonna cost us and how is that gonna impact us? So that's just, that public nature of it is really, really, really valuable. Um, I've said this before, but uh, we all try and make sure we get out and meet with the whole spectrum of the healthcare system. Um, next week, I'm going to a treatment facility center that we have from going to another treatment facility center. I've been to a number of hospitals, many hospitals, a number of independent primary care clinics, and that just makes sure you're making good decisions. Um, this is just sort of a slide that I've used before about the role of the care board and what we do and don't do, because sometimes people think we're all of healthcare, we're not. Um, what we regulate are the insurance rate review, right? So that's really Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP for their small group and individual group. We decide how much money they can charge. They'll ask for, I think last year might have been 17, 18%. And then we'll make a decision look on all the evidence that we received in that quasi judicial process. And we'll say, you know what? You didn't hit that standard. You didn't prove this much. You didn't prove this much. You're going to have a lower amount. And also, beyond just with the evidence, we have to think about what this is going to do to Vermonters. Can they afford this? So that's that role. Certificate of need, that's you know, just to ensure that there's appropriate allocation of resources and people aren't buying too much. Um, there could be some recommendations around changing around that to expedite it. That's something where I think the care board can improve. I think we should handle some of these quite a bit quicker. Um, last year, uh, my first year, we adjusted and made automatic the amount of money that would get captured. So now it's actually the max that it can be. So for us to have review, the trigger is the most money under statute that we're allowed to have it at. And it's automatically renewing every year to, based on inflation and other factors to how high it can be. So it's at the max that it could be. Um, I think there's arguments that it could be even higher or certain types of care could be uh, not fall within jurisdiction of CON. So, you know, CON laws are written, but then there's changes in what we have in our healthcare environment. And so today, does it make as much sense to prolong and delay how long it takes for a treatment facility to come up or a mental health facility? There's arguments both ways, but I think that's an area worth discussion. Um, hospital budget, ACO oversight, I think we're all relatively familiar with what those are. Just a couple of things I'm gonna highlight that we don't regulate, which are FQHCs. We don't regulate independent providers. We don't regulate ambulatory surgical centers other than CONs. If they're from a hospital, we do, but not otherwise. Um, DAs, we do not regulate. Medicare and Medicaid, we cannot and do not regulate those. I go to a lot of meetings and people tell me to increase their Medicaid. I can't do that. We can't. Um, Self-insured plans, Medicare Advantage plans, we have no regulatory authorities um, in connection with those. 
Uh, so affordability really matters because it means that people it can have adverse impacts on people's health. People delay care when they can't afford care, right? They don't get primary care. They might not, they'll just avoid or delay care. They'll buy down on insurance. We don't want that. We don't want people buying down on insurance because of the financial decision that they have to make. Um, so we try to keep an eye on how Vermont is doing um, in regards and respects to affordability. Um, I hear people say, well, it's healthcare, it's not gonna be affordable. I think those kind of broad brush statements don't really capture the nuance of what we're trying to do. Yeah, it's never gonna be affordable. It's not in this entire country, but does that mean Vermont has to be the worst or near the worst, or can we do better, right? And it's really about doing our best, not saying like, oh, look, forget that bucket. I think we have to tackle it because it has real impact on Vermonters. So this slide gives you um, some data. I've said this before and I'll say it again, healthcare data is, uh, to me, directional, and you need to uh, test it from multiple angles. So um, in the hospital budget process, we had comparison data that helped us compare how much people are spending on admin costs, how much money they're spending on clinical care, how much it costs to discharge a patient. And any hospital system, they're very complex, might have different ways that they account for the money, which can change what those numbers really should be. Um, but if you take every change, you now no longer have a comparison because everyone you're comparing it to may also have changes, right? So if you change everything for one place and you don't change every one of the other 100 hospitals, there's no comparison left. But it is true that all this data may have some nuance to it. And so I think it's important to not look at any of these things as definitive of anything, or really directional and temporally over time. Where is it moving over time? This is our qualified health care plan. Um, expenses and where Vermont started in 2019 and where we are today. Bottom line is United States, the top line is Vermont. We started higher for a number of reasons. Um, we, we don't have community rating as an issue and what we provide for, for people, what we require in our qualified health plans is greater. So you actually get more with a Vermont plan than most plans in the United States, which is a good thing. So we start higher and that's explainable then we go up quite a bit faster than the rest of the country. I think we grew out of 58.5%. The rest of the country was under 5% on average. So we're growing quite a bit quicker, more quickly than, than other parts of the country. Um, our spending per capita, um, we're a very healthy state. We're really blessed with an incredibly active population. We're old, that's true, but we're a very healthy set of old people. That should really keep expenses down. Healthy people don't cost as much. We're fortunate to have a very healthy population. So around 98, 99, 2000, Vermont was actually in line with spending per capita with the United States. We were, we were equal, right? We were right there on average with the, with the United States. Since then, we've, we've, we've expanded. That could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. It could be some combination. You might want to spend more money on health care. We don't want to be Mississippi. They don't spend a whole lot. We want to spend more but we wanna make sure we're balancing it. So here you can see just where those lines start to diverge and then how quickly our spending is compared to the rest of the country. Um, I'll spend just a second on this one. Um, this is a uh, total premium for employer-based payments, employer contribution and employee, right? So you have a, you work, you have a job, your employer pays some, you pay some, and then there's a total amount. So um, the top, Top line is Vermont, so here. The bottom line is the United States. The top is the total premium. So our employer-based plans in 2017 were on par with the United States. We were consistent with the average of the country. Since 2017, we've grown faster than the rest of the country on our total premiums for our employers. And our employer contribution has also grown faster. Our employee contribution has remained relatively steady with the rest of the country. So our employers are paying more, our employees are paying less. It could be because of a competition for employees here is tight. It could be our, our employers are more generous and they provide better benefits. We're concerned that this bottom line is gonna to start to diverge um, as we go forward. We've heard anecdotally that a lot of employers are starting to shift some of the financial burden as it's gotten particularly acute to their employees. So this could change. That's something to keep an eye on. And just add also <clears throat> the nature of the plans could decrease, right? So it's not just how much you're paying, but what you're getting for it is often um, sacrificed. Right. Um, 
healthcare costs show up in a number of different places. Um, they show up in the state budget. They show up in our health plans. Um, at the care board, uh, every state agency is seeing fairly large increases on how much we're paying for health care this year. Um, it also shows up in places you don't really see as much in the press, which includes property taxes. So this year, there's a report. I think the number will hopefully go down quite a bit. But the average property tax bill is supposed to go up 18 percent, 18 and a half percent. That will come down, I think. But that's a really huge increase on people's property tax bills. And a big chunk of that is because of school spending on health care. School spending on health care is going up 16 percent this year. It's expected. So people's property taxes are going up because of the health care costs. Um, insured rates and uninsured rates. These are another metric we kind of keep an eye on to think about whether or not we're having um, adverse consequences to increased costs. And you want a low uninsured rate, obviously, and you want a low underinsured rate. Vermont does very well on uninsured. We have a very low uninsured population, but then we have a very high underinsured population. That means they don't have enough insurance to cover and they can't pay for the care that they need. So I, I think about my brother. My brother's a carpenter. And he's up on roofs, probably on a roof today, hammering nails. And it's dangerous work. And he's on an individual plan, right? Actually, now he has a fiance and he's not. But, but other carpenters will be on individual plans. And I hope he gets married soon because he's been engaged a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's listening to that. <laughs> on the record. He's heard me say it before. In any event, there's, there's a level of equity to how we allocate health care costs, right? Because people with high paying jobs and like lawyers and doctors and others have less risk to their physical safety. Than so can I just stop you there? Yeah. I mean, there is a perception that doctors have the high paying jobs, but that is not categorically accurate, nor is it true for lawyers, but lawyers probably make more than doctors. We'll have to look at that metric and understand. I'm, I, fair, yeah, fair point. It, it struck a note, sorry. No, fair point. I, <laughs> relative to much of the, it's a fair point. In any event, some of the work- There are people who earn a lot of money. <laughs> we know that. A lot of the people who earn a lot of money are not doing dangerous jobs. <laughs> that's really yeah. my yeah, that's yes. your point. You get and it. their insurance plans are generally more favorable than those who have dangerous jobs. Yeah. Right? And so if you have an employer-based plan, you're not paying that much. But if you have an individual plan, you pay a lot. Right. So a lot of the laborers have a very, very high uh, yeah. insurance expense, whereas others with less risky jobs don't. And when you're trying to ensure financial stability for the system, what's happened in Vermont is a lot of that pressure has been put on commercial insurance. Right. But they, they call it the cost shift. Um, and we'll debate that all the time. But in any event, much of the money that we need is coming from commercial. That pocket of that pool of people is shrinking which makes it even more difficult for them to sustain those costs. And as the costs go up, more people exit that market. Um, it's not necessarily the most equitable way to uh, appropriate, the, appropriate those costs, right? Because it's not based on income. It's not a tax system. It's not progressive. It's, it's kind of by happenstance what your job is, really. Um, so anyway, our underinsured rate has been um, increasing. The underinsured rate over the last several years is going up, which is something that we want to be mindful of. Um, I'll go through these quickly so I can turn to, to these folks. Um, but I want to touch briefly about our, our Medicaid spending per beneficiary. There's really three sets of money for healthcare, Medicaid, commercial, and Medicare. Our Medicaid spending is, is quite high nationally. We're, we're on the higher end. Our commercial spending is on the higher end nationally. And then our Medicare spending is last. And from my perspective, that's not what we want. We want to pay less with Vermonters' dollars, commercial insurance and Medicaid, and we want to spend more with the federal dollars. Um, and we have an aging population, so we're going to have more people that are being paid for by this money. And so we actually want this to go up. It's kind of confusing. How can you be so high on two measures and dead last on another? So we want this number to be more balanced. Um, you can see we actually were going up quite a bit. And then around 2017, we were at 9,829 per beneficiary in Medicare. And then we dropped down, started going down, while the others started going up. So that's something we want to be mindful of in the Green Mountain Care Board's decision making. Um, 
real quick, this is, so there's a finite amount of dollars is the point, and we need to allocate them correctly. And part of the allocation is kind of system-wide, how much are we putting in primary care, how much are we putting in mental health, how much are we putting in hospitals? But then within that, how much money are the hospitals spending on those preventative type services versus other services, right? So nationally, uh, the country spend 30% of our healthcare dollars on hospital spend. Hospitals are a more expensive place to spend money. They provide some of the most important care and it's going to be the most expensive care. Um, in Vermont, we spend quite a bit more uh, on hospitals than, than what you see nationally. We spend 47% of our healthcare dollars on hospitals. That might be a good thing. A lot of our hospitals, particularly today, are providing a lot of services that aren't available in the community, right? You've probably all heard about the, the boarding issue we have. And part of that is because they can't get the patients to an appropriate care setting or the patients are coming in because they can't go to urgent care or primary care. So we're using the ED for that. So some of this could reflect that service that they're, the gap, the care gap that they're filling. Um, and some of them may provide different services than other hospitals nationwide. Um, I'll turn to Elena after this, but um, we don't use our hospital system a whole lot. We have low utilization compared to national. So this is a national median of admissions per 1,000 residents. See Vermont is way down on the lower end of the spectrum. So we spend a lot on our hospital system, but we access it less. Um, on a per capita basis, right? Yeah. Um, and I think part of this is, so this is a, um, a chart um, national database using Medicare cost report data that looks at hospitals break even points. So that is the amount of funding needed um, from a commercial payer in order for a hospital to cover their costs. Um, the purple bar charts are for the kind of the national median and the red bar charts are for Vermont hospitals by size, so bed number of beds. So what you can see here is there's quite a bit of variation, um, but on average, Vermont is much higher in terms of the commercial dollars that it needs in order to cover its expenses. That could be for this um, kind of rebalancing that, that um, Chair Foster mentioned before. Um, so hospital adjusted expenses per inpatient day. So about, again, this is kind of the cost trend. So we were kind of below the national average, but have, have eclipsed um, the national average more recently. Um, and so there are a variety of ways to think about kind of what you're getting for your dollars, and there's no perfect way of measuring this. One way is you know, thinking about our mortality rates, um, more access to care. So while we have lower mortality rates, as, as Chair Foster mentioned, you know, we, have, we do have a healthier population in some ways, um, and our access looks quite good in terms of the number of um, clinicians that we have, um, but we still struggle really with wait times. Um, this is you know, a little older of a report and we'd love to see this updated, um, but this is kind of a, a challenge of, you know, we do have low utilization, but there's still a lot of Vermonters that can't necessarily get the care that they need when they need it. And that, that's part of the um, system-wide challenge that we're facing. Um, and as, as we've been talking about, you know, hospitals are just one, one setting of care and they could be doing a lot of different things, but they really rely on the broader delivery system to perform their duties and to, to do that well and to serve um, patients. Um, so we have you know, our federally qualified health centers and other community health centers, ambulatory care centers, um, extended care, um, and then the acute care setting. And all of these things really have to work together to have efficient, high quality, high functioning system. It's um, one area um, that you know we know that we have significant access challenges, despite having a number of bodies available to us, is Vermont primary care. Um, and nationally, we are you know depending on how you define it, you know this is the definition um, that is used to compare across states. This is not the same Vermont definition that we have in statute. Um, but when you look at this national comparable um, definition, it, you know we're kind of in the half median to lower half in terms of how much spending we have on um, in primary care. Um, but when you look at the Vermont definition, that increases to about 10.2%, but it's hard to know how that compares to other states. Um, so, you know, it's a struggle. And, and just because we have more dollars doesn't mean that they're being used in the right way. So, you know, dollars are one way of looking at it, but there's definitely a greater need to really understand what high quality primary care means and when it's happening. 
<laughs> so admission is increasing, or sorry, admissions are decreasing, but the length of stay is increasing. Um, so this, you know, speaks to some of the pressures on hospitals and being able to transition patients out of the hospital into the appropriate care setting. Um, you know, there are a number of pressures that we've heard about through the hospital budget process and, and elsewhere, skilled nursing facilities, mental health, um, housing, all of these things are very important um, and, and will need to be discussed and, and, and thought about. Um, so we'll do a quick, I, I, I don't want to take up all the time, so I'll do a quick update here um, and then we can dive into, you know, specifically 67. Um, so as you know, or may have heard, 2022 was one of the worst financial years for hospitals. This was after the federal funding dried up um, and volumes were still um, kind of coming back. And so it was a real, real challenge nationally in a lot of closures. Um, and so, but in 2023, at a national level, hospitals began to rebound, you know, since our volume came back um, and their margins look much better. At a system level, I presented a similar slide. Um, last time at a system level, you did see kind of a rebound, um, but I didn't have all of the hospitals reporting, so I didn't show you kind of the level of detail. And these are still in flux as they're still reporting their audited financials through the end of the month. Um, but what you can see is that there is quite a bit of, of um, you know, negative margins still still pervasive um, across our healthcare system. And this is largely the smaller hospitals that are not part of health systems. Um, you know, with the exception of CVMC, um, the other hospitals that are in the black are those that are part of a larger um, entity and have kind of more fluidity in their funding to cover um, some of those costs. Um, hospital budget requests this year. So we set a 8.4% to year, 8.6%. Um, NPR, so the net patient service revenues, that's kind of the whole budget that you will be accepting or all the revenues you'll be receiving from patients. Um, and the re requests came in at 19.3%, so that's a two-year rate. Um, commercial price was around 9.84%, um, and the operating expense growth um, assumed in these budgets was around 5.71% at a system level. Um, we compared some of these commercial rate increases to a variety of inflationary factors to try to understand, you know, how reasonable this was relative to what Vermonters can expect to pay. And it was quite a bit higher. Um, you have the Medicare market basket, you know, at 3% median household income in Vermont at 3.9% um, relative to the system-wide hospital rate increases of 10.6%. And um, this wasn't an exception to the rule. I mean, this is a trend. Um, that's been ongoing and um, is, is a real challenge um, for the board and, and for hospitals, frankly, to, to navigate. Um, and this has real implications for the rates. You know, we see this in our QHP rate review process. Um, cumulatively, this is showing rate increases cumulatively over time. So from 2019 to 2024, you know, we have 860 to 80% growth um, in rates, which is huge and really affects how, how people can engage with the healthcare system. Um, and the board does its best to control that rate growth, but there's really only so much you can do when you're juggling kind of affordability on one side and provider solvency on the other. Um, you know, nationally, the rate re rates have been increasing, um, and <coughs> some of the rates you know, around six and a half percent are staggering in other states, and ours are well, well beyond that. Um, and, and it has, as you mentioned, real implications for families, um, what they get for that money, and then what that means to them in their everyday budget. Yeah. There's, there's also a sustainability challenge with that. Right? So the statute that we are charged with executing says that we should evaluate Vermonters' ability to pay for the care. That's one of the factors we're to consider. How can, can we afford it? And so if income is here at 3%, and rates are 10 or 15, you can do that for a little while to, to keep it going, but over time, you can't. And that, I think, is part of why we're at 167 of how do we need to transform the system so we have an optimal allocation and using the resources as efficiently as we can, because this won't, it just can't work. Eventually that collapses. Um, so that said, we were able to make some reductions to the commercial rate this year, so an amount of 7.8% across the system, um, so $145 million, but this is, you know, um, perhaps not sufficient to make care affordable for Vermonters, um, but we also recognize the challenges that hospitals are facing um, in terms of their inflationary pressures. Should you um, correct them? Yep. 
So, so this is the, it was a two year guidance period. So we considered the fact that what hospitals got last year in conjunction with what they were asking for this year, right? So two years, that, that's what we looked at last year, um, fiscal 23, there are very, very, very large rate increases. I think in part because of the board's concern about sustain, sustainability and keeping our healthcare system going. And if we were too aggressive with the levels of uh, rates, it would have been very <laughs> this year. Uh, so they had a year of planning with large amounts of money. And this year, we, there was lower increases than the year before because much of the money was taken up the prior year. That being said, I was actually just counting it before we started. I think seven of the 14 hospitals received the budgets they requested, um, the rates and the NPR. Um, 10 of the 14 hospitals received within 2% of the rate increases they asked for. Um, so 10 out of 14, and then um, four had cuts larger than 2%, reductions from what they asked for. Um, and each of those when each of those had asked for more than a 10% rate increase and had received large rate increases the year prior. So you can see some of our decision-making around that. Um, the other thing is NPR, that total amount of money that they can bring in for patient services, that's NPR. Um, we went well above guidance, guidance was 8.6. For the most part, I don't think we adjusted NPR uh, other than a small amount on maybe two hospitals. And some of my thinking as one board member on that was that we have access problems. And so if you keep the rate at a more affordable level, but you allow <laughs> for the services to increase, the hospital can make the exact same amount of money, right? More volume to address our access and backlogs and wait times, less money for each service, nets the same amount of money they asked for. So we're trying to drive that access while balancing the affordability. So that's what some of these decisions were, at least for me, um, predicated on. Great. Yeah. So this just shows that basically the NPR remains largely our net, net patient net revenue. Net patient revenue. Thank you. I net patient revenue remains largely under. We have we have an acronym list in our committee, but it's not with us. So there might be some folks around the table. Just bring some with us. <laughs> um, name tags. Yes. <laughs> Um, so largely untouched, I think, for these reasons, because of some of the access challenges and wait times, we would like to see better throughput through some of our um, providers. And so the, um, the board has largely left those, with the exception of when hospitals come in with utilization assumptions that are wildly different from what we see in actual. Sometimes there may be an adjustment to reflect what we can, you know, realistically expect. We don't want to overestimate what, what we think might happen. Um, so I know you spent some time, but I'll just really, really brief history of Act 167 from the board's perspective. Um, you know, this work is is not new. <laughs> These trends are not new. Um, rural hospitals have been struggling and small hospitals have been struggling for quite some time. Um, there have been 191 closures um, since 2005 and 148 of those since 2010. And this has only been exacerbated. Um, by the pandemic and, and other kind of challenges to the way that we pay for healthcare, um, and you know this has largely affected those you know smaller um, hospitals that that don't have um, uh, reliable funding sources. Um, so Vermont hospitals were no exception. We you know observed these declining margins over time, and as you, we mentioned, this struggle, this tension between um, solvency and affordability, um, with as you know, discussion this morning, the um, bankruptcy of Springfield Hospital was really, really concerning um, to the board and, and to many of you who were around um, then. Um, and so the board came, has had been like kind of discussing, you know, what is, the, how much can we do <laughs> um, with our current process that really puts this tension right in front of the board? How much are you going to add to commercial rate? And, or how much are you going to add to the hospital, you know? Uh, financial challenges. Um, so this really requires a system solution. Um, and this was, you know, kind of discussed within the confines of the rural um, um, rural health services task force. Um, you passed Act 159, asked the board for recommendations. Um, we provided recommendations, and then those recommendations served as a basis for um, some of the um, language in Act 167. Um, so just as a quick 
know, quick reminder, the board suggested the design and implementation of hospital global budgets um, to provide more um, flexible and sufficient equitable funding to hospitals um, and a health systems optimization expert to facilitate community engagement so we could think about what we should deliver where based on the needs of the population and how we could do that more efficiently, improve quality and access, um, and then providing the resources necessary to make those changes. Um, and that was really, you know, we're very thankful um, for the Act 167 work and the funding that you appropriated for this purpose because we think it's one of the most important things that the state has um, done um, in these years. We uh, quote you on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's pretty exciting. laughs> um, yeah. So I, I just, you know, we, we kind of organize it and you have these two sections, but we organize it in these four buckets. Um, so, you know, and specified leader and follower, I think, as well in the statute. So the subsequent all-payer model agreement led by AHS and the Director of Healthcare Reform. Um, GMCB was to lead and collaborate with AHS on developing value-based payment models. Um, we were going to evolve our, our regulatory process. Some of that work has started just prior to Act 167, and then um, the community engagement work, which has been a real um, eye-opening um, experience um, for us at the board. Um, so now we'll, we'll dive into the meat of what you asked us here today, um, but I'll turn it over to my colleague, Um, okay. um And thank you for the opportunity. I feel like that was all a, an, an exceptional and comprehensive setup for the exciting work that we're doing on the uh, community engagement piece, which is where the legislature gave us the opportunity to go into uh, communities and talk with our um, friends, neighbors, colleagues um, in each community in Vermont um, to gather feedback um, on the current state of the health care system, not just through all these numbers, but through the actual uh, you know, lived experience of people in our communities, um, as well as start to look for uh, solutions. So in my current role at the Green Mountain Care Board, I serve as the project director for the community engagement work. I'm going to walk you through a couple of slides on the progress uh, of that project, which completed its first phase uh, at the end of November. So it's a good, a good place to give you a status update. Um, so first, I want to introduce you to the uh, Oliver Wyman principals that we hired to help us complete this work. Um, many of you may have already met them through the planning and community meetings that have happened so far that started in the summer um, and fall. Uh, so this work at Oliver Wyman is led by Dr. Bruce Hamery, who is a clinician, leader, and facilitator with over 50 years of experience in healthcare practice um, and systems. He has uh, three years of experience in Vermont as well. You may be familiar and it was cited earlier, the health services wait times report from 2022. He led that work um, as well as the um, COVID data modeling with the Department of Financial Regulations. Regulation. Um, he is located in central Massachusetts, so not terribly far away um, and is planning trips up, up here to Vermont um, meet with hospitals, community members, and lead our second phase of meetings, which will be in person. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to meet him yet through some of the virtual meetings, um, you will have another opportunity, plus he'll be here in person. Um, as well, this work is led by Elizabeth Sutherland, um, the second principal. She brings an expertise and was brought into the project um, with Oliver Wyman, um, because of her expertise in state health equity through her most recent work, identifying health equity zones in the state of Pennsylvania, where she is located. Um, and she will also, uh, they also have a team um, that supports their work uh, at Oliver Wine. So um, I'm really excited to be working with them and hope you all get a chance to speak with them directly. So this project uh, contract started in August um, and it ran through several months of engagement plan development. So these are, are roughly the phases. Um, the, first, the first phase that went, ran from August through October um, was uh, specifically to plan how the engagement was going to be done. Um, so there was a round of um, meeting with stakeholders all across the state, um, many of 
who may be in this room, who helped us actually plan um, out how the engagement um, and was going to happen and, and give feedback to the Oliver Wyman team. Um, they were targeted to community members at large, providers, um, members of diverse populations, um, and they submitted, they presented a couple of iterations of the plan, the Oliver Wyman team did, um, and we worked with our partners um, at AHS uh, to approve that plan so that they could then begin implementing it in October, um, which was the public uh, first public phase of the of the plan, which ran from October through November, and that consisted of uh, meetings out in the communities done virtually, um, which were focused on community specifically community members at large and and providers. Um, that ran about six weeks. Those meetings, I'm going to go through sort of the numbers and the stats of, of how many people we spoke to during that time. Um, it was a bit of a condensed timeline, but I think it generated a tremendous amount of publicity um, with help from um, all the legislators, all the stakeholders we work with who helped get the word out um, so that so that people came. So I think that that six week time frame really made it um, that there was a lot of attention on during that during that period of time. Um, and those meetings wrapped up uh, at the end of November. Um, the current stage we're in now through March is the data synthesis and analysis, where the Oliver Wyman team will use the data collected from the listening sessions, so the, the uh, qualitative data, um, as well as relevant analysis of health system claims and hospital discharge data to inform preliminary options and recommendations for uh, hospital systems. Um, so we're in that phase um, right now. They're working through a uh, uh, data analysis work plan um, and we'll begin scheduling meetings. Um, they'll start the scheduling process in the next um, month or so um, and begin those communities later in the spring. This is a timeline that's been pushed out a bit since we addressed the Health Reform Oversight Committee at the end of November. Um, so for people that heard that, I think at the time we said this was ambitious. We discovered through the data analytic work plan process um, the availability of data that the work would be able to be done better if we could push the timeline out uh, a little bit. And there didn't seem to be a reason to watch anything. So um, the, the community meetings are going to start more, we're looking at now, um, May, which hopefully um, for legislators will allow you to participate a little bit more. So, um, so uh, let me ask you the quick question on the, the March uh, date. If we were to ask to have some preliminary report or report of the data analysis in March. Um, so it, it won't be ready in March because they are still uh, working through the data analysis. What I am going to um, what what we do have now is some preliminary um, sort of findings from those community meetings. Um, and Dr. Hamry is actually coming to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting on January uh, 17th. Right, so next week. week. Um, and he's going to talk about that. So that's what we have available now. Um, what about March? I mean, just thinking about two committees getting together and listening to the preliminary report. On what the data is showing? Yes. We can, we can talk to the Oliver Army team and see what they might have available okay. in that period of time. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and ask him about it on Wednesday uh, as well. Uh, so I, th I think that probably covers, yeah, so the round two meetings, again, we have spring 2024 here. We're looking at having those actually start and happen in communities in, in May. Uh, you can go to the next slide. That's why. It's not going to be released unless it's due. Okay, so we are really pleased with the numbers of people and the organizations that were engaged. And I think this is uh, really a, a testament to how in, um, involved um, stakeholders were in legislators in helping us get the word out um, to get people to come to these meetings. Also, um, they were, we made the decision to have them done um, on Zoom for this round so that there was, it would increase the, the accessibility uh, for people to be able to join. Um, we also listened to feedback about the best times. Um, most of the meetings were held in the late afternoon or evening specifically for um, 
providers so that it wouldn't disrupt people's um, work day. Um, but also we found for many community members, those um, later afternoon or evening times were just better in general. It's impossible to find times that are that are good for everyone, but most of the meetings were held from 4 to 6 p.m. or from 6.30 to 8.30. Um, but then we also hold, held several meetings uh, at different times at 9.30 and I think 11.30, so people have the opportunity to join those. Uh, and it generated a lot of uh, participation. I want to highlight a couple of things on this slide. Um, we had uh, over 1,800 participants across all stakeholder types and meetings, so across the community and provider meetings. Um, the initial phase of the engagement planning, we held 16 meetings with uh, 91 participants. So that was just for planning the, the process um, and, and making the plan. Um, and then we moved into the, the community and provider um, based meetings, which you'll see, which I can walk through the numbers here below. Um, but on average, there were approximately 52 participants um, per community meeting, including the statewide meeting. So that I've been through a number of stakeholder processes um, in my time with the state of Vermont, and this seemed like exceptionally good uh, participation. Um, and over 100 organizations were contacted for their input and to get the word out that these meetings were happening. Um, the all overwhelming team sort of broke these numbers down for us into these different groups. Not every, it, it's not necessarily clear who kind of fits in where, but I can kind of walk you through and let you know what each of these categories are. Uh, the team met with hospital leadership and boards uh, directly. So those were 28 meetings with 235 participants. Uh, there were meetings with diverse populations. Um, this is the work that was led by Elizabeth Sutherland. So she was doing sort of co a concurrent process specifically um, to outreach to uh, groups that are more difficult to, to reach back to the, the equity uh, and inequality conversation from earlier. Um, also, I'd make a point there that um, our board meetings um, are very open, transparent, people come, people comment, but that's not the same as going out and, and trying to reach people where they're at. People come who have a specific interest, they make comments, um, but there is a specific focus on this project to go and try to um, meet communities uh, uh, where they're at. So that is, so the these meetings specifically, the diverse populations, um, it was with organizations, it was with the state's um, Office of Healthcare Equity. And then there was uh, several meetings that were organized specifically to reach uh, a disabled population, um, as well as um, with the um, uh, organizations serving uh, mental illness. Um, and that generated, so 13 total meetings and uh, 96 uh, participants. Um, our state partners uh, with 12 meetings and 18 participants, those were specific meetings with different uh, state uh, agencies and departments that would have, you know, um, a particular uh, point of view on, on these issues and questions includes obviously the Agency of Human Services, who we've worked in close collaboration with, um, Department of Health, Department of Mental Health, the EMS Office, um, and State Office of Rural Health. Uh, the community leaders groups, that was another bucket that included Vermont NEA, the VSEA, uh, Vermont Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals, um, and Vermont Business Roundtable. Uh, the, so then we get to the community meetings and the provider meetings. Um, these were held in all uh, 14 HSAs around the state. So we covered the entire state. There was both a community-focused meeting and a provider-focused um, meeting organized specifically to get clinicians. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, all, all types of clinicians. Um, so there were 18 community meetings. So that's the 14 HSAs plus four statewide meetings. Um, there were 931 participants in those meetings. The provider meetings uh, directed specifically to people who work uh, providing healthcare services directly. There was 14 meetings with 460 participants, um, as well as specific provider interviews and other sessions. There's 15 of those with 128 participants. Um, we had the, um, at each of the meetings, uh, we also had participation 
uh, from Green Mountain Care Board members so they could hear the input. We had coverage at each meeting uh, from board members as well as staff working on the project. Um, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate participated in probably every meeting as well as um, worked with us significantly through the engagement planning process um, and provided input. Um, and I'm probably left groups out, but we do have an extensive list of, of all of those organizations and others who participated. Um, and all the Oliver one with you did these um, did these count for us. Um, Dr. Hamery and Elizabeth Sutherland facilitated each and every one of these meetings um, with help from their staff. So they were uh, extremely busy during this six week period, doing two or three meetings a day, um, which was <laughs> possible through uh, the virtual platform. Go to the next slide. I just want to comment that's, that's really outstanding work connecting with all those people and organizations. Yeah, thank you. We're really proud of it. The team worked really hard. It's really wonderful to uh, to be able to, to to speak with and feel like we brought um, so much of the, of the healthcare system together to provide their feedback. Um, so, uh, like I said, this is really I really only have a basic high level key themes from from the round one. Um, Dr. Hamry is going to come and, and present directly. I think it'd be better to hear it from him um, directly. To the board, so we would invite participation in in that meeting. Um, but at a at a high level, uh, community members and <laughs> providers reported both challenges and bright spots within these key themes. So I don't I know there's a lot of uh, difficult statistics that we've gone over today. A lot of things that look um, sort of um, bleak, but people also brought um, bright spots. Um, particularly, you know, stories around exceptional care that they've received. Um, at Vermont hospitals and from Vermont providers, um, but there are a lot of challenges, as, as we know. Um, so those themes um, are organized into the, the categories we have here, um, and this, this is sort of the way uh, that Dr. Henry and his team will kind of start looking at solutions, um, but it's around hospital and provider operations, coordination between organizations, transportation and infrastructure was a huge uh, area, workforce, Financials, um, patient-centered care, healthcare services. Um, none of this is a surprise. Um, this is all going to be familiar. It's issues that you are and and we are already working on. Um, I think the important thing here is that um, this process really brought the community together to talk about these um, to talk about these issues, and that and that is the focus of what we're trying to do. Um, so again, this qualitative and quantitative data will inform the round two conversations, um, which will be bringing actual options and, and recommendations to the communities um, directly. And that's the, the later spring work. Um, so then next, I think my final slide is the next steps for the community engagement work. Uh, so as Dr. Hamer and his team are working through the data, he is going to bring back to the communities um, options um, for their for their local areas. Um, and again, the, the important thing here is that he's bringing these options back to the hospital boards, back to the communities. Um, it's not a you have to do this, you must do this, or the Green Mountain Care Board is going to tell you to do this. Um, it's here are some things that you can do. I think of it as sort of this Act 167 work um, has provided um, sort of technical assistance for these communities to start looking at um, things that they can do to improve sustainability. So he's going to bring those options directly to the communities in the spring, um, talk with the hospital boards, talk with communities about them, gather their feedback, um, and then uh, turn that into a report back to the Green Mountain Care Board on what he has found. Um, and then we can go from there in terms of solutioning. It would it, it could be thought of as things that the legislature can do, things that the board can do within their, um, within their authority. Um, also, you know, things that could just be implemented within communities um, without any, any type of action. So um, that is the exciting work that we have ahead of us. Um, it's, it's a, I'm really excited to be working on this project and have this opportunity to talk to you about it today. Um, and, my remarks. Great. Thank you. Good work. Well, one, one thing I would say about the recommendations and the types of options, they're, they're going to be pretty diverse. Um, I think there'll be discussion about 
identifying care gaps and what we need to add systems. There'll be opportunities about even, there will be some things that the legislature could be involved in helping for solutions such as licensure issues or regulatory issues, whatever they may be that are beyond just money, right? There are so many other things, um, efficiencies, EMS, all the transport, all these things work together. So that I think there will be a pretty wide spectrum of things that we can address to start tackling some of the challenges we do have. And thank you for recognizing how great the work's been. Yeah, it's been great. So just another question regarding the timeline, um, having the options available during the summer, um, it would be helpful, maybe this is just a message, um, helpful if at all possible when we have folks in in March that we get kind of an inkling of what some of the options may be. And understanding the, and I understand the analytic process, so it's not always simple. Great, so we'll move on to the, the next section, um, just developing value-based payment model, including hospital global budgets. I lost my Zoom connection. You guys can still see it. Go ahead, Senator Weeks has a quick question. While you're doing your IT, uh, can you just give us an example of what the range of options might be, or just a couple examples of what options would be? Yeah, I, well, let's see. I have, um, I mean, I have sort of broad categories, um, but they, so far, I know the team has been looking at, um, you know, they can be areas around um, service addition recommendations, service transfer recommendations, um, service avoidance recommendations, intra-HSA collaboration. I know there's some of that going on now. There could be more um, areas for that. Um, uh, those are kind of some of the high level categories that he's given us. I don't have more um, specific recommendations that I don't even have them myself. So <laughs> before you continue, we also had one question a while ago. Mari Cordes is online. Mari, did you still have a question? I do. This, thank you very much. This is about um, the community engagement and um, the list of folks that were involved in, in this outreach, including um, provider meetings, state partners. Um, were pharmacies, pharmacists, whether hospital-based, community-based, independent pharmacies um, involved in these conversations. And um, yeah, they do. I'd like to have further conversation um, about making sure that pharmacies and pharmacists um, are involved um, as um, really critical partners in community health um, and potentially um, an add um, or an addition um, to uh, meeting gaps in, in communities where they might need um, healthcare provider access and there's no clinic. Um, pharmacies uh, may be able to help some of that. That's a great point and a great question. I believe that the association was, but I would probably will double check that for you. It's not on the list that I have in front of me, but the list I have in front of me is not exhaustive of the of their full contact list. Thank you. Is it, I wasn't sure if we were asking questions now or not, so I didn't raise. So we're, we're, I think what we'll do is if there's a question of clarification on the um, Act 167 community engagement. We'll entertain those and then we'll try to move on because we have a hard stop at 1030 and I, we want to take a short break prior to that time. So, okay. You have a question? Well, I, Go ahead. I just would love to see the full list of the organizations that you participated with. Um, I had made a number of suggestions early on and I just wanted, I wanted to know if they were followed up on um, and I also, I, I participated in a, a several of the, the community engagement things, and some of them were awesome, really great conversation, and some of them were not. Um, and some of them were, frankly, for uh, they were a little bit hijacked 
by what I will call hospital plants of people who went and um, sort of tried to steer the conversation into their direction. So, I mean, I'm assuming that Oliver Wyman is professional enough and experienced enough to sort of recognize that and deal with that kind of, um, you know, shift in the conversation. But I just wanted to know if that's been part of the conversation of sort of how do you um, deal with that? And there were a number of people who uh, I <laughs> suggested send written comments to, and I know that you've got a lot of those, and I'm that's going to be part of the analysis too. So I'm going to suggest that that's a that's a great question, but that's a question we can get an answer to, may probably through the appendices when the report comes out, but maybe beforehand, you could share <coughs> with Senator Hardy and others. Do you want me to respond to that now or hold? Yeah, let's let's hold. Uh, that's that's a different question. We have to go through the whole list. And so. is there a quick answer? Second part, I could respond. To yes, that one you can do. Um, so I recognize that great point. They were open meetings, so anyone could go. Um, and there's sort of certainly a, a challenge sort of in making sure that we can sort of drop, um, pull in the, the full community and not just people that are already engaged. Yeah. Um, so I'll take the opportunity to say that there was, there was a whole other set of meetings sort of happening that were being facilitated by Elizabeth Sutherland, where she did more um, targeted interviews directly with communities. There was the, um, specifically a very successful one with the disabilities community where they organized their own um, meeting for that community specifically and made it um, uh, easier and more accessible for people to come. So it's one way that we uh, address that. And you're right, we don't have the written comments, uh, the numbers of written comments, but we received an incredible number, which I can get the exact, exact number of either people um, sent in follow-up written uh, comments, things that they said at the meetings, or just people that couldn't go to meetings mm -hmm. um, sent in comments. And those are also would be part of the analysis as well. Well, but it is a concern that there's some redundancy and people are traveling around the state to make the same comment in other parts of this geographically. And one of the goals was to have a geographic understanding of community needs. So, but that, so it, it is a real issue and you've addressed it somewhat, but it's something we probably want to hear about going forward. Okay. Thank you. So back to and I will try to speed through the rest in the next minutes. Um, so I, I won't read through your language, but you directed us to design a global payment. Um, I just want to kind of recognize that in order to design an all payer global payment for hospitals requires Medicare's particular um, and the opportunity right now to engage with Medicare is through the AHEAD model, which you'll hear from um, our colleagues at AHS um, on more detail. But that was really the starting point for the Medicare portion. Um, so the GMCB staff have been working with um, AHS and Director of Healthcare Reform um, to lead the Global Budget Technical Advisory Group um, to solicit input from a variety of stakeholders um, in anticipation of the release of Medicare's payment model and methodology. So we still don't have those details. So we have some insights about what it could look like, but there's still that this um, black hole of understanding. So members included representatives from hospitals, payers, unions, advocates, um, and others based on their technical expertise. So this is really kind of like a how would it work exercise. Um, and the charge was to make recommendations for conceptual and technical specifications um, for a Vermont specific alternative to the Medicare standard methodology. Um, so we anticipate federal limits and guardrails to any methodology. So, you know, we certainly have one view of what we think they might be willing to accommodate um, and have been trying to kind of work through that. Um, so there have been meetings approximately every three weeks for two hours since January. Um, and you know, all of our materials are posted publicly on our website, so you can kind of follow the slides and, and the kind of areas. Um, so they covered a variety of topics, um, so including defining services to include in hospital global budgets, populations, um, commercial payer participation, provider participation. So should it be mandatory or voluntary, or how would we engage um, either of those groups? Um, calculating baseline budgets um, that you, kind of what you would start with in terms of your overall revenue that you would take in and, and how would it grow, what kind of adjustments might there be to the budget, um, and then you know thinking through how that would work with regulatory processes as a second step. Um, and then 
transforming transformation administration and valuation. So all the other things. So what would a hospital need to do to be successful under such a model? How would um, we administer it and then evaluate whether it's working? Um, so where we are kind of headed next. So um, so the global budget is kind of a global budget tag and those technical recommendations are kind of being wrapped up. Um, we expect Medicare to release their specifications in February. Um, and then there will be some hospital specific modeling about what the Vermont model would do for them. And then a comparison between the Vermont specific model and the Medicare um, specifications. Um, we are also beginning now because this was largely led by um, thankfully board member Lunge with her expertise um, and, and AHS and some of our staff, um, but to start engaging board members who haven't been kind of involved in this process to help them understand kind of what we've learned um, and then public engagement. So there'll be a variety of public public um, uh, presentations on um, the work that has been happening. Um, in, in terms of evolving our regulatory process, so um, as part of this um, legislation, you asked us to recommend a methodology for determining the allowable growth um, in Vermont hospital budgets, decide how to or determine how to best incorporate value-based payments or global payments into the board's regulatory process and consider the appropriate role of global payments for Vermont hospitals. So um, does this make sense and how? Um, so resolving these three, you know, we haven't figured this all yet out yet because there are a number of moving pieces to consider. Um, it requires understanding what can be negotiated with Medicare um, as, but you know, we are already kind of thinking about evolving our regulatory process with or without, um, I should say, you know, in anticipation of, or um, if, you know, as an alternative to, but a brief history of hospital budget regulation. Um, so we've actually had hospital budget regulation since the 80s. Um, it's looked quite different. So it turned into the Vermont Healthcare Authority and we had Bishka and then the Green Mountain Care Board more recently, but this is not a, a new process. Um, you know, why regulate hospitals? As we mentioned before, hospital expenditures make up nearly half of our, our spending um, and is growing kind of exponentially compared to other states. Um, Vermont's healthcare system is only also highly concentrated. So we have a non-competitive monopoly market. Um, Vermonters, some Vermonters don't really have an option to go, you know, beyond their community hospital. You know, some have um, more capability to kind of pick and choose where they can go and can leave the state. But this is really a matter of equity and making sure that all Vermonters have access to best quality care or have, you know, access to care at all. Um, you know, so as I mentioned, the board was already kind of thinking about, we kind of adopt this continuous improvement framework every year we're, we're learning. Um, and so, you know, before the passage of Act 167, we started thinking about establishing objective metrics for hospital financial health, improving the evaluation of um, delivery system and hospital performance. You know, as we mentioned, hospitals are just one piece. A lot of what we observe through their budget process is <coughs> other parts of the healthcare system. So parsing that out is often quite challenging. Um, but there are ways that we can do that and get data and measures to help us understand what's happening. Um, alignment of our regulatory processes, particularly hospital budgets and rate review. This is where that, that tension kind of exists, how much we end up paying for you know, insurance and, and rate growth versus um, hospital growing hospital budgets. Um, and then we would like to increase the consistency and predictability of our regulatory process. I think COVID was a particularly challenging year. Um, and kind of recognize give space to the delivery system to do what it needed to do as quickly as it needed to do it. And now we're trying to kind of pick up the pieces and, and figure out where, where we are going next. So um, there, you know, we're always looking to minimize the administrative burden. That doesn't mean we don't want data or want to know what's going on, but we want to make sure that we're asking for what we need and that we understand, you know, the whole system over time. Um, and so that is, that is a challenge, but as technology improves, it's it's much easier to kind of, you know, when I think of administrative burden, now it's not the amount of data, it's how often you change what you ask for. So I think if we can kind of move towards standardizing and then kind of, you know, there's ways to automate the actual reporting, we shouldn't be reporting less. Um, we should provide more transparency, just mm -hmm. more predictable. So th this was our first year with this new regulatory process with benchmarks. The whole process was really focused around benchmarks, comparing hospitals to like hospitals, academic medical centers to other academic medical centers, small regional hospitals, community hospitals, critical access hospitals to others, right? And so you can see, are they starting really expensive? 
Are they asking for huge increases? Is there a reason for it? And so that judicial process I talked to you, I spoke about earlier, that's what we're doing. They have to make a case, we evaluate it, we look at how expensive they are to start, how much are they asking for, does this make sense in context of what we're seeing? So the benchmarking really, really helps do that. So this year we put it in the guidance in March, which we voted on March, that said here are the various benchmarks we're gonna be looking at. And then this was Sarah Lindberg, our former director. Uh, we owe her a huge nod and appreciation for her really advancing this. We're really fortunate to have Elena step in and take over totally seamlessly. Um, but in terms of like the resources allocation, I spoke about that earlier. It's for us too. How much burden are we putting on a small hospital like Gifford, right? The hospital's small. Their asks are not as big as UVM. UVM is a much larger, more complex system. I think you saw in this regulatory process, we spent a lot more time looking at a larger ask, larger financial asks than we did smaller financial asks. So the seven hospitals that were approved as submitted, those are pretty quick and painless and easy. Um, two hit guidance and were quickly approved. The other five were pretty pretty easy too. Um, UVM's ask was much, much larger and it's a more complex system, so it took more time and we spent it. So CON, we wanna make sure we're putting the right amount of time of ours and burden on, on the regulated entity, the same as possible. So I'm very aware of our <clears throat> time, um, so if you can, get to last good place, it would be great here there. Um, so I won't reiterate, you know, we, we set this, we, for the first year, I think, capped commercial rate increases so that I won't get into technicalities of it, but we had, you know, we, we find our level of detail, lots of work to continue to make that connection with affordability, but there was a, a significant improvement in using data. Um, and not all data is gonna have a one-for-one one adjust, you know, we're not gonna use data to, there's no formula, right? So there's a lot of data, none of it's perfect, but it can help us understand directionally what's happening. Um, this year, you know, we're, we're in the throes of it right now. We're, we're kind of starting our first draft of guidance and, and we're gonna expect to set more benchmarks, financial health, you know, net patient revenue has been one that we've, we've relied on, but really focusing on commercial prices, operating efficiency, and financial health, and balancing these markets. Yeah. With, with an eye to how important our community engagement process has been, uh, is this an iterative process with hospitals so that there is an ongoing discussion? Yes. Good. So um, actually in our rule, February 15th, we have to start, you know, what are the targets that we'll be thinking about? And um, so we are engaging in those conversations. And then, you know, while the Act 167 community engagement recommendations will just have been coming out, we wouldn't expect the budgets to look substantially different because hospitals won't have had time to digest that. Um, but we would love to hear from them on kind of what they've learned and what, what they think, you know, is coming and what they'll be thinking about. Um, so I'll just, I'll turn it back to Dr. Foster as our last slide. So. Um, just want to thank our team and Julia Bowles for putting together this material. The committee for happiness. Sorry. We have a noise back here, so <laughs> yeah. it just got really like hard to hear. So I think you were just saying thank you, but if you, there's more, we need you to speak up. <laughs> to these guys and Julia. And yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, this has been a terrific overview and background, historical context for us. Um, and th those of us around the table understand the work that's been going on over many years, but we also understand our role and your role, and we'll continue to work together with this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, we're going to go offline for five minutes and take a little break. How about 10? All right, we're back. This is a joint meeting with... House Health Care and Senate Health and Welfare. We're continuing our look at what's happening as a result of Act 167. We're now going to join, uh, have Wendy Trafton join us. And Wendy, why don't you introduce yourself for the record? And then we have your PowerPoint here and we'll get it up on the screen as well. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Wendy Trafton. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of Healthcare Reform in the Vermont Agency of Human Services. And thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, should I share my slides now? That'd be great. I want to make it a little bigger, if you can. 
It might be out of my wheelhouse. I'm going to try. Presentation. Yeah, on the far right. Little... Lower right corner. Right. With a little podium looking thing. Um, I just have to move some things around a bit. I used to have an expert. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, good. That's great. I just lost something. Well, thank you. Um, my testimony today is an update on the Office of Healthcare Reform's work related to Section 7 of 2022, uh, Section 1, which is the development of a proposal for a subsequent all payer model agreement. So, for the record, she did. Are you going to? Did you introduce yourself? I did, but I could yeah. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, no. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> nervous of some being able to share the, the <laughs> screen. <laughs> right, the charge is listed here, and that includes, uh, we are previously, but I'll just repeat, the development of a subsequent agreement with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which secures Medicare sustained participation in multi-payer alternative models in Vermont. Ensuring the process for developing that proposal includes opportunities for meaningful participation, and I'm sorry, um, for meaningful participation from the full continuum of healthcare and social service providers, payers, participants in the healthcare system, and other stakeholders. Uh, providing a simple and straightforward process to enable interested stakeholders to input easily. And providing an update by March 15, 2013, which has already been submitted last year. I'd like to um, provide a brief background on the current Vermont All Payer model. The Vermont All Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement, which is signed by the Governor, Secretary of the Agency of Human Services, and Green Mountain Care Board Chair, is an ar arrangement with the federal government that allows Medicare to join Medicaid and commercial payers to pay for healthcare differently. Within the model, the state has accountability for cost, population health, and quality. The model creates a mechanism to shift from paying fee for service for each individual service to predictable prospective payments that are linked to quality. The goal of changing payment is to reduce healthcare cost growth, maintain or improve quality, and improve the health of Vermonters. Uh, the current model that we're in today relies on an accountable care organization to develop a voluntary network of providers that agree to be accountable for care, cost, and quality for their attributed patients. The original performance period for the model was 2018 to 2022, so it's expected to have five performance years. We're currently in a two-year extension period, which is set to end this year. Uh, the extension period was suggested by the federal government to serve as a bridge to a future uh, federal state model that um, at the time of those discussions was still under development. Um, at that time, it was expected that the federal government would implement the new model in 2025. Um, so there are many benefits associated with continuing to include Medicare and Vermont health care reform. Vermont is and has been a low cost state for Medicare. By continuing to participate um, in these programs with, uh, with Medicare, it supports the development of baseline financial calculations that recognize the state's past reforms that have saved money for Medicare. Um, <laughs> so we've had positive evaluations showing that uh, there's been savings generated from programs like the Blueprint for Health and SASH. Um, continued participation allows Vermont to influence Medicare reimbursement for providers. Uh, it maintains over $9 million in annual funding for Medicare's portion of the Blueprint for Health and SASH. And it allows for certain waivers of Medicare re regulations. These waivers allow um, the state to deliver care differently. Um, and it uh, also allows the state pro to propose new waivers during the terms of the demonstration. Um, and it also allows for alignment in priorities, payment models, quality measures, and reporting, which sends a stronger system to the healthcare system partners. The Agency of Human Services and Green Mountain Care Board met regularly with CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, while the new model was in development. 
During this time, uh, we received significant feedback from providers and other partners regarding elements of a model that would be important to the state and uh, in order to advance healthcare reform in a subsequent agreement. Um, so our current partnership with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation allowed AHC, AHS and GHC, GMCV to educate and inform the federal team developing that model. Uh, we continuously reinforced a lot of the things we were hearing and have learned over time. Um, those are supporting rural provider stability and sustainability, recognizing concerns we were all hearing about workforce and inflation, increasing the predictability of payments. So although currently Medicare offers advanced payments under the, the model, um, it requires reconciliation of those payments back for service ensuring the right amount of revenue. Um, so the state has been effective in keeping Medicare costs low and new model, model uh, methodologies, particularly ones that are multi-state methodologies must recognize that's the Vermont has had. Um, need to support investments in preventive and community care. Make sure that payment models and quality measures are aligned across payers as much as possible and allow Vermont to move forward on important health care reform um, efforts. We've really been clear that transitioning to a new model should not require the state to move backwards because there's been many success successes we've achieved with the federal government and many of the demonstrations we've been a part of. Um, so I think I mentioned this slightly, but the federal government has decided not to continue single state agreements and is seeking to offer models that multiple states can apply to under consistent terms. They've indicated that states like Vermont, Maryland, and Pennsylvania that currently have single state agreements can apply to the new states advancing all payer health equity approaches and development, or as we typically call it, the AHEAD model. Um, a notice of funding opportunity was released on November 16th of last year, which this provides further details on the model. There are still further details still to come, but um, this lays out a lot of the, the um, approaches and strategies within the model. So there are multiple cohorts that vary by the length of the implementation period and implementation start date. Uh, proposals for the first two cohorts of states are due on March 18th. Uh, the earliest implementation date of the Medicare payment provisions of the model would be on January 1, 2026. Uh, and you have the states who want to start January 1, 2026 must apply for cohort one and be selected. Um, so this meet timing means that the current model will need to be further extended um, or Vermont would be reverting back to fee for service uh, payments for Medicare and lose some of those other benefits we mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, the state and federal government are currently negotiating what a 2025 um, demonstration year might look like with the goal of providing a smooth transition to a new multi-payer model in 2026. Um, so as mentioned before, Act 167 directs the health Care, the director of healthcare reform to consider multiple elements in a new agreement. The AHEAD model does include many of those elements. So they include total co cost of care targets, global payment models, strategies and investments to strengthen access to primary care, mental health and substance use disorder treatment services, and strategies and investments to address health inequities, social determinants of health. Uh, while we've raised the need to focus on healthcare effort, healthcare reform efforts across the care continuum, including subacute services and long-term service supports, the model does not include explicit strategies for achieving this. So that is something we've continuously raised with the federal government and would need to be doing some really creative state-specific thinking on, on how to achieve this. Um, but uh, CMMI has stated that the AHEAD model aims to support hospitals in transforming care delivery and shifting utilization to primary care and community-based care settings where appropriate through the incentives and flexibilities of the hospital global budget. So they see those supports coming sort of out of that hospital global budget flexibility that would be provided under this model. So the next few slides focus on opportunities for par partner participation to date. 
Um, so AHS and the Department of Financial Regulation convened the Healthcare Reform Work Group in 2022. It had, uh, it was pursuing four goals um, and mentioned again, it started in 2022. So at that time, the, the <laughs> goal was addressing issues impacting provider stability in the short term, many of which were caused by the COVID-19 public health emergency and associated workforce issues. Addressing challenges created by the current regulatory environment on provider stability, informing the design of future financial and care delivery models in anticipation of the state of Vermont entering a subsequent agreement with the federal government, which would allow for multi-payer reform and informing activities that support long-term hospital sustainability. So consistent with um, the item above. Um, so the work group includes participants representing hospital and provider groups and healthcare payers. Um, it has several groups and technical advisory groups that are focused on specific topics or issues. Uh, since the summer of 22, uh, AHS has extensively engaged the healthcare reform work group. It initially focused on that short-term stability I've mentioned and resulted in a list of action items related to workforce, regulation, systems flow and revenue. In the fall of 2022, uh, work began to establish a framework to inform discussions for the next multi-payer model. Uh, in February 2023, uh, several technical advisory groups were formed to support technical discussions on design of a global budget model, which uh, we just heard uh, discussed by the GMCP, um, and Medicare waivers that would support care delivery transformations under a new model. Care and primary care work groups were also added. And then additionally, in 2023, while discussions, at, um, there were a number of discussions at existing HS and GMCB forums, mechanisms for public input on our websites, regular updates at GMCB public board meetings by the Director of Healthcare Reform, and numerous additional meetings with provider groups. I'll cover this in further detail in the next few slides. Um, so AHS, oops, sorry, do that one rather quickly. Uh, the AHS leveraged, leveraged existing forums uh, to promote engagement with a wide range of stakeholders. So this included multiple engagements with the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living Advisory Board and Mental Health Integration Council convened by the Vermont Department of Health and Department of Mental Health. It also included engagement with the Green Mountain Care Board's primary care advisory group meetings, which are now weekly with the Healthcare Association Coalition, which includes membership from the American Academy of Pediatrics, Vermont, Bi-State Primary Care Association, Health First, Vermont Association of Adult Day Services, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, Vermont Care Partners, Vermont Dental Society, Vermont Healthcare Association, Vermont Medical Associate Society, and the VNAs of Vermont. Um, it also includes presentations of, to various organizations. So some of the examples listed here are um, the Cathedral Square Board, Vermont Information Technology Leaders Board, EVA Clinical Utilization Review Board, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital Annual Meeting, Vermont Medical Society Board, Health First Leadership, and the co-chairs of the Health Equity Advisory Commission. For the, that's our um, continued update from our March 16th, 2023 report. Can you do something for us? And that would be, um, let's just hypothesize that the AHEAD, we were accepted in the first round for the AHEAD, AHEAD participation. And then that became our program and implemented. What would that look like for our hospitals, our providers, our community-based services? Can you just talk about it on a very uh, sort of a boots on the ground? Perspective? I can give you a sort of a high level overview of the AHEAD model. And that would be good. Okay, great. And we'd be, if invited, we'd be happy to come back and give a further we can do that. I'm just understanding that Act 167 has significant influence in what's happening. I think Vermont is having an influence on what's happening yes. at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And some of the reasons why the federal uh, is, is moving from individual states to multi-state, seeing the benefit of what 
Vermont and, and Maryland's doing with their hospitals and Pennsylvania with their global budgeting. But so but we do we are having an influence, which is nice to know. So it would be helpful to hear about ahead ahead of when it's happening. <laughs> so, so the way the federal government sort of defines ahead is their goal is to collaborate with states to curb healthcare cost growth, improve population health, and advance health equity by reducing disparities in health outcomes. Um, so participating, so, so far they've noted that this model would be available to up to eight states. This first, we mentioned that the application deadline is March 18th for the first cohorts. They've indicated they would select up to five states in that first selection period, preserving another three for the cohort three. Just going to that timeline, since we're here and we have a timeline, a March timeline for negotiation or putting the no vote, you know, responding to the request for funding piece. Um, and here we are as a legislature, and we ha we might have some suggestions that we would like to make. How can we be involved before the March 18th deadline? We're currently working through all of the various components and questions that need to be responded to. Um, so um, we can sort of I'm happy to take back thinking through the best strategy to do that and which areas you might want to influence the um, and influence the, the language on. I will note a lot of it is very high level and um, and really CMMI looking for states to communicate their, their readiness to be able to participate in this model. So a lot of the details are going to be worked out from between the being selected and starting that implementation period. So that implementation period would start on July 1, um, if you were selected um, and go through, so July 1, 2024, to the likely uh, execution of a state agreement on July 1, 2025. Um, but that said, we do have to be very thoughtful thinking about how this will work within Vermont. We've uh, talked previously about trying to um, figure out, you know, with the Medicare methodology versus the uh, state specific methodology for health hospital global budgets be better for the state. So we're trying to work through a number of those elements now. So it's also my understanding that there's less attention being paid to long term care in and, the model and, and di disabilities. Uh, so um, can we influence that in any way? Or is that, is that some decision that's been made? Well, we have been, um, so we have pushed forward looking for the model on the national level to really be including and thoughtful about how we're engaging in those important areas of across the care continuum. So as we've heard those there, impacts the quality of lives of individuals, as well as all other parts of the healthcare system. Um, but I, the model itself is really the way it indicates those are uh, included, <laughs> are really within those hospital global budgets, which, and within, and I'll just note the, the there's, that with the strong health equity focus, um, people with disabilities, for example, are a population of, of concern in our, our work to address health disparities. So as we develop our statewide health equity plan and the hospital are developing their health equity plans, I would expect there to be <laughs> on these populations. I just uh, would obviously be interested in your partnership on some of those strategies because um, there isn't significant funding coming for those purposes from the federal government. It is something we are going to continue and will continue to um, to be exploring where could where could be be strategic in this area. Second part. One second. Are you good? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and ask my first question again. So, but, but, <laughs> do you want me to? No, you that help the same thing. Head model. Okay. Yeah, and my question is probably that question. Um, I'm on the screen. In three years, going on for this is for my fourth year dealing with healthcare. Right, yeah. I'm still trying to get my head around all these models. Okay, what does what would a head replace in our system, or does it, or is it an add-on? What exactly 
What problems does it get at? <laughs> and that's similar. So I'll try to answer that in the other. That's our question. Yeah, so that's a great question. <laughs> there we go. So today, the Vermont All Payer Accountable Care Organization model agreement is the way that we're able to uh, change the way Medicare participates as a payer here in Vermont. So it allows um, Medicare to pay differently in an alignment with Medicaid and commercial insurers. Yeah. Without that, Medicare would continue to pay for fees for service, offer Medicare Advantage plans, but we wouldn't really be able to um, have that multi-payer alignment. Right. Um, so that is what the federal government's saying, that's sort of ending. <laughs> Um, what we did is we had that, because we had the relationship, we had a good opportunity to really push what is working really well within our current system. What do we want to see recognized in a future model since um, they weren't uh, sort of willing to accept a, a subsequent request from us, which was sort of what Act 167 asked for is a, sub, a model, a subsequent agreement model. So what we did is we really pushed on, these are the things we need to see continuing, these are Vermont's successes, this is what it would mean to move forward on healthcare reform. Um, so the, their response was participate in this multi-state model ahead. It has many of those elements that have been successful in Vermont. There's some things that we wish to see in there that, that aren't there, like I mentioned a, a focus across the care continuum. But I think they were really trying to say, if we're sunsetting, these special agreements we have with Vermont, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, how can we make sure there's some flexibilities for those states that continue to be doing um, you know, what has worked well for them or continue to advance reforms in those areas? So to that, the, um, the participating states that are selected to participate under a head, they'll be accountable for state-specific Medicare and all-payer cost growth target, so that's similar to what we have today, but also primary care investment targets, so that is that is something new. Um, accountable for population health and health equity outcomes, so we have uh, population health and quality measures under our current program, but this is a new, uh, a new focus on health equity, which I think is very exciting for the state and consistent with a lot of, uh, a lot of efforts that have, have already been, been happening, but a real Focus to be doing that in our healthcare reform efforts. Um, so it has. We have a, we have three questions in the queue. Okay, I'm sorry, my time. <laughs> too long. So Representative Chena, who's up on the screen. screen. Representative Rebecca and Senator, Senator Hardy. Hardy. Thank, you. thank you. Okay. Um, I'm still struggling with understanding like what exactly ahead is going to do. It sounds like um <clears throat> sounds like it's going to replace the single the the one care with something that goes across state lines um so i guess i, I have i'm so confused cuz does this mean we just spent millions and millions of dollars on administration of one care and it's just going to go away and then um and then i guess i'm wondering how much is it going to cost to join this this partnership and like what the benefits are and the risks are and i'll stop there i'm still really struggling with understanding it and I'm also really sick, so I'm very confused today by everything. <laughs> <laughs> this is I'm not club. helping. <laughs> Join the club. I think, so we didn't do a comprehensive ahead model no. of overview. So I'd, I'd be happy to, yeah. I feel like there's going to be a lot of questions on that, if that's something we could. Yeah, but I think his question is really important to answer in terms of, it sound, it, it's not a, uh, Joining other states. It's a, no, that's yeah. very, that's key. That's key. So, it, so I'll answer that and I'll also just go over the model components and sure. Um, yeah. Finish that first question. Yeah. Um, so by multi state, it just means they're putting out an opportunity for more than one state to be a part of this model. So no other state could come in and say, I want to be in the Vermont all payer account care model agreement, right? Um, it doesn't, if we were in a head, it doesn't mean we were working with Maryland or another state. It just means we were all under consistent terms. We'll have similar state agreements with those other states, um, but our agreement is between the state and the federal government. Um, we would, 
have we like other states that are selected our model would include components like hospital global budgets and enhanced primary care payments as well as um, we would be implementing their the strategies laid forward to improve care management mental health and substance use disorder integration and have a focus on health related social needs um, so there's there's flexibilities on how states do that. Um, and we have a lot, of, um, a lot of work behind us to actually have a good step forward into doing this. So um, thinking about sort of the blueprint for health really puts us uh, forward in, in being ready to do a lot of the advanced primary care work they're seeking and care integration. Um, so we're a lot ahead of other states in that area. There's some other states that have done more in the hospital global budget space. So we'll, that will be newer for Vermont. Um, but all, all of the up to eight states selected will have those similar model components. We'll learn from each other, but we're not compelled to to work together in any other way. Um, I think this is very exciting and I'm so glad that we're beginning the conversation where we can all learn more about the head. I've heard a couple of things. One is that what we've already done in Vermont has greatly informed this model um, and been a kind of significant um, component of, of, of building it. Um, and also that we've had a visit from the director of CMMI recently. Um, so I think that's very promising. I might go on on a limb to say that's very promising for our application. It also suggests that we might have some um, ability to be more innovative and step ahead of ahead <laughs> um, in areas um, around where a head really isn't going to get Vermont ahead. Um, <laughs> like, if I understand right, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, components of a head in, like, in substance use and mental health are actually funded by the areas where providers are making cost savings and aren't those reinvested into mental health and, and substance use. So if they're not making great savings, we're not going to have great investments in mental health and substance use. Is that how it works? Well, there are enhanced primary care payments and um, and we've been really pushing the uh, the fact that we need to continue Medicare's participation in Blueprint and SASH. So thinking about ways in which we continue to, to work on sort of Blueprint expansion efforts and using those, you know, working with the, on the advanced primary care requirements under the model. I think that has some, some additional promise to, to meet what you're discussing, but also Yes, there aren't a lot of new dollars that they were saying, here's a new funding stream for these other areas across the care continuum, um, except real flexibilities in those, you know, new flexibilities under hospital global budgets, as well as in the advanced primary care payments, which, which are an additional uh, added uh, PMPM payment for the related to this program. I want to understand that better. Thank you. Well, we will, we'll this is the first our, shot, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Senator Hardy, go ahead. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, I think it would be really helpful to have a deep dive into what the AHEAD model is, because I didn't actually understand your answer to Representative Rebecca. Um, and so that's concerning. Um, and so also, it, will this model include um, an ACO? And if so, how will the ACO work in this model? So the model does not require an ACO. It's not an ACO model. I think um, thinking about functions that an organization like an ACO can perform is something that um, we're continuing to be able to think through and that infrastructure that is um, currently available and supportive of our healthcare reform efforts and how to make sure that some of those activities are continued. So um, that is an area that is a, a difference from our current model to the one today. And CMMI has indicated an ACO wouldn't coexist in the same way that, that our system does today. But that 
doesn't mean that the functions performed, um, some of the functions performed could not, could not continue. So there's a possibility that we could take the, the couple good things in our ACO and get rid of most of the bad things in our ACO. Um, the balance been more bad than good in my opinion, but is that is that a possibility? Yeah, I think uh, opportunities for sort of that centralized infrastructure and support um, are ways that would CMMI would allow those to continue under the model, but they would not allow a risk bearing ECO to be a component. Okay, that's good. I just hope we have her back to do a more deep dive. Into I'm sorry, but I didn't hear what you said. Could we do, uh, could we do a more deep dive so, into the ahead model? So, Senator, yes. Uh, one of the issues that um, we covered in our Health Reform Oversight Committee was a deep dive. And then I did provide my committee with the slides that you brought into that meeting. And this was an opportunity really to look at S-167, and then we will come back to whatever we need to do going forward to offer some suggestions on the AHEAD model, and that will happen. You know, so we'll have to do that sometime before March, but this is not. I, I, I did ask for a little bit of information on AHEAD today. Um, I think we both did. Uh, so, uh, but we'll have to get that possibly another day. But this is a very good conversation because I think it helps get some of the fundamental questions out that folks have. Um, I, I, we did ask a number of questions during the uh, HROC meeting. One yeah, that, that was November 30th, and, yeah. if, and we, we'll send out the link yeah. and the You can look at that link. That'll get a start for anyone who'd like to do that. Yeah. Was it November 30th or November 5th? No, it was in the end of the month. Oh, we had to end it. At, we had yeah. to put it at the end of the month. Okay. 29th or 30th, one of yeah. those dates. Okay. Um, I think what I would love, and we don't have to do it here, but a uh, more clear understanding of from um, you all is, is what you do need from the legislature before March. My understanding is there the the any updates, changes, things we want to maybe get in to the model is now only happening once we're accepted. Um, so I'd love some clarity on that if you can answer it now. And and just in general, what you know, what do you need from us from March? How can we make sure that the intent of the legislature is included in the application. In the application, um, so right now, as I mentioned before, we're really working through what are our ways to be responsive to the questions laid out and which will be scored and, and, and be the way that the federal government decides which states to select. Um, so, so, so we are working through those. I can't off the top of my head think of the specific areas where we might ask for um, persistence. Um, but definitely once we, if, if we are selected and need to move through that, uh, the negotiation process of what would the Vermont state agreement look like, I think that is um, an even more opportune time to be thinking about and, and having those conversations with CMMI. Because right now, um, we, as I mentioned before, we were meeting with them very regularly to inform the model. But as soon as this notice of funding opportunity was released, they're no longer allowed to talk with us. So we can't really um, influence the elements of it now until we're selected and can start those conversations again on the, the agreement during the pre-implementation period. So I think um, for those, I've heard some concerns from, from people that um, the legislature is not involved in this process. And so help me, correct me if what I'm about to say is incorrect, but when we passed Act 167, we put our intent in legislation of what we wanted from the next all-payer model. That intent helped direct the conversations you all were having with Green Mountain Care Board in collaboration with the federal government. We've now gotten to a point where they have outlined the ideas and some of the basis behind the model. So now we apply for it. And then our intent will continue to evolve and we will continue to provide our intent through the negotiation process. So although we don't specifically talk to the federal government, we provide you our intent during these phases for healthcare reform in Vermont. And that collaboration then happens at the agency level with the federal government. 
That's exactly right. And particularly where uh, we had the slide where we went over the elements within Act 167, which were important to examine during a subsequent agreement. So that directed sort of our attention to those areas and our discussions with CMMI um, and those further opportunities are forthcoming too, in which we would be engaging with you. Great, thank you. All right, so legislature passes its statutes and you do all the good work and then negotiate with the federal government to make it happen other places, but to take us a next step. I'll say forward. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so th this is great. Um, other questions that folks have, I, I, understanding that this is just like the, the 1,000 foot, 10,000 foot level on the AHEAD model, and, uh, certainly both committees will have a chance to look at it further. Go ahead. Art? Yes, I, I'm looking at your first slide. Health, you're the health office of health care reform. How do you interface with the Green Mountain Care Board trying to make its reform? What, how, how does that work? Um, yes, so we are within the agency of human services. Um, and I think there was a really great slide that the Green Mountain Care Board shared during their presentation with the various elements of Act 167 and where sort of GMCB took the lead and AHS collaborated versus where AHS took the lead and GMCB collaborated. But we work very closely in our discussions with CMMI um, and within some of those uh, technical assistance groups. Um, we had mentioned particularly on the hospital global budgets, um, Chair, and uh, sorry, Green Mountain Care Board member uh, Lunge and the Director of Healthcare Reform co-chaired those um, those meetings and and staff really part in participating and being very um, helpful on all of the other work on many of the other work groups. So, been trying to at least make sure we're we're all hearing, learning, and and you know. Okay. Explaining to the federal government the, the position of the, right. the state of Vermont. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. So, in terms of the work that you're doing on 167 and next steps, you've done a, a, a huge amount already. And uh, AHS is working synchronously with Green Mountain Care Board. Can you talk a little bit about? The, sort of the intersection, not just with the AHEAD model, but also with the 167 work that's going on I, I, through the secretary's office probably more, but you're also a part of that. Is there a specific section you're referencing? No, just generally how you guys are working together with the Green Mountain Care Board. Yeah. It, I mean, I don't know how to fully answer that other than we're we're very collaborative and in approaching all of the work we're doing so um particularly one of the highest areas of activity at least for me i don't want to speak for everyone across the agency or our office but is working on the development of the proposal to that is due March 18th. So we're we all have varied responsibilities in um, developing sort of the content related to that. So there's just a lot of sort of seamless communication in, in that work. Um, and then where there's a number of other activities happening, I think we're all trying to to be as as helpful as well as gleaning all of the information that's being learned from other activities. So for example, the great stakeholder work that's happening, that's going to be an important part of informing things like our, our health equity strategies. Um, so I think, I don't know if that fully answers your question. No, that's, that's good. It's just a flavor for what, how things are happening. The, uh, did, were you involved when the CMMI folks came and visited along with the Green Mountain Care Board? And so uh, the one story that I think is very informative about <laughs> our rural environment is uh, the CMMI folks came in and their experiences have all been in larger urban areas. And I think one of the really smart things that happened was that I don't know whether it was you or the Green Mountain Care Board put everyone in a car and took them to the Northeast Kingdom to understand uh, the rural nature of Vermont and our health care system as being geographically 
remote. So yeah. we did have great discussions with uh, for two days, one with with providers who are uh, kind enough to sort of come to a single location, despite us trying to really get that statewide feel. And then, yes, we did quite a, a caravan <laughs> to the Northeast Kingdom. And I think that was very helpful to, to see what this looked like at a um, at, at a single hospital, but a hospital that, you know, looks like hospitals that serve Vermonters uh, across the state. And so um, I think that was very impactful for them and, and the team they brought. And they were very excited about stopping for creamies too. Uh, <laughs> it's good. Well done. Uh, Any other questions? Any, uh, okay. Just very quick. Um, the AHEAD model has a website. And I'm wondering yeah. if you think that's a good resource or is it not necessarily a good resource? Um, the federal website, I think, does have a lot of uh, good material. It's, it's great to hear their perspective, too, on, on what they're seeking to achieve. We are monitoring it regularly because they're doing these frequently asked questions documents, as well as um, they're having opportunities for office hours for states to call in. So, so we, I, I visit that website quite a bit, and I... Some of the infographics are, are good pictorially. They don't give you that full detail, but between the notice of funding opportunity and some of the materials on there, there's, I think it's a helpful way to, to really ground yourself in the, the model. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I, I understand the 167 was one question. The head is a slightly different one. We appreciate your expertise and coming in and sharing with us very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, um, I, unless there are other questions for Wendy or is there any, oh, just before we, we end, I'm going to look around the room. Is there anyone looking at Green Mountain Care Board or a Blueprint um, or others, Diva Hospitals, any comment you'd like to make or questions or? Oh, I'll for just the, add something. Separate. Why don't you come up sure. here so we can hear you? Thank you. I took the comfy chair at the back. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to put it in my terms if I can. Introduce yourself for right. the record. Um, I'm John Soroy, and I'm the Executive Director for Blueprint for Health. I've spoken to many of you. Um, it's not all of you. Um, I'm going to put it in my simple terms um, because I don't deep I don't dive deeply into the website like my colleagues in, in, the, in the corridor do of healthcare reform. I, I looked at it. Um, the, there's like I think one image and a slide that I saw, and I said they're copying the blueprint expansion that the legislature just funded. And the reason why I said that was because they're emphasizing enhanced primary care, which we've we've talked about, um, that it's that it's more than diagnose, treat, and out, out the door. It's screening for other things that might be affecting a person's health that you don't necessarily get about in an interview. And it's embedding um, a person to help address those needs. For example, a community health worker, which you all, uh, the legislature funded. Um, for blueprint and we're already implementing so that was my just very quick reaction like they're they're very in my view the the hospital hospital budget global budget, global budget they're, they're taking that from maryland and they're taking a lot of the screening for um mental health substance use disorder from rhode island and from vermont now i don't know what's going on in every single state but if i could ask them and listen in on those rooms where they all come up with that's what it looks like on the surface, but I'm not giving you a heavily technical explanation because I can't. <laughs> we, we like heavily on technical. It was just, it was just, it was my immediate reaction of like, are they listening to our conversations? Are they visiting our website? Did they watch testimony? It was a bit, a bit odd, but well, flattering, I guess. And it, and it, it looked like that because, you know, we were instructed under Act 167 and we did have that opportunity to really go forward and push um, a number of the really successful initiatives in the state. Yeah. So, um, so they were listening. And, and, <laughs> they were and, listening. and I, I, I'm not prepared to give you all the dollar figures, but Medicare underpays in the community health teams. They underpay into patient-centered medical home. They, they just do. They literally underpay. And we have evidence that people with Medicare take advantage, as they should, of community health team resources that, that we're not getting our fair dollar amount from federal government. I mean, it, that's just, just uh, that's, looks. Uh, that, that's actually a big question. You know, uh, one of the one of the concerns that I've had from the beginning is we're doing all of this and we're we're 
it's not an add-on, but it's it, it, it is an expansion uh, in care and continuity of care, and the federal government has always underpaid the state of Vermont, and they do underpay Medicare. So, what resources will we get? What incentive payments will we get? I know I know it's small, but we will get some incentive payments if we are selected for a head. Was it $2 million? So there's sort of two funding streams. Yeah. Making me think about there's the $17 PMPN um, uh, per member per month uh, payment for advanced primary care. So that goes to the eligible population. Um, and then there's also, uh, which you were referring to, the cooperative agreement funding. Yeah. So um, states who are selected can get $12 million to be spent. <laughs> That's uh, better than two. On model implementation over the first six performance periods. So about up to $2 million per year, although one of those is a six month chunk. So the first 18 months is $4 million. Thank you. This was helpful. Yes, thank you very much. It depends on where you are relative to the elephant in the room, what you see, and you are seeing primary care for us, and that helps us. And, and Blueprint extends, as you all know, into addiction, into women's health, for sure. So it's, it's, we're, we, we are definitely more than that. But when I looked at their model, I just just looked like they were listening in on our conversations. Yeah, exactly. That's well, great, right? Are, are we proud? Well, yeah. no, but yeah. the blueprint, true, uh, we, true. yeah, and we all know the blueprint has has received significant attention across the country ever since we started it, and it's just so important to us all. So thank you. Thanks for your work. Thank you for your work. Any other questions? Any other comments? What happens when we ask for comments? Yeah. We're good. So we'll 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 call it a day. Yep. We can okay with that one? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you all. We can go up there.